What's up my fellow poker enthusiasts, it's Renee aka The Wacko here and together with my co-host Adam Carmichael we present to you the Mechanics of Poker podcast. In this podcast we deconstruct high stakes poker players, figuring out what it is about them, how they think, what they do that makes them so successful with an extra focus on the obstacles they faced and the skills they had to develop to surpass them. Over the years, me and Adam have gained a lot of experience in both reaching high stakes poker ourselves and teaching other players to do the same. We have bundled all this knowledge together in our coaching program, The Mechanics of Poker, which is the most complete poker coaching product on the market. If you want to have a chance to work with me and Adam so you can get unstuck and make more progress in your poker career, go over to mechanicsofpoker.com to apply. But without further ado, let's learn from another high stakes player's journey in today's episode. Welcome back to another episode of the Mechanics of Poker podcast. Prepping for this podcast and learning more about today's guest, guys, got me fired up for this episode. Because we will be chatting with Frank, currently playing under the nick Mr. Balderman on GG Poker. And for the more old school players like myself, I know him more under the nickname Mayo the Don. Frank has been playing poker professionally for over 14 years. And whilst never having played high stakes, he managed to win millions of dollars over the years by being consistent and disciplined on and off the tables. Frank has played over 20 million hands of online poker and has had various 300k hand months Played numerous crazy long and high volume sessions with his longest ever being 52 hours straight in which he played 50k hands and managed to get unstuck after being down 35 buy-ins. Tell me if you've ever experienced something like that. This guy's on a whole nother level. Whilst his unique ability to grind more than 99% of players has been a big contributor to his success and could be seen as a blessing, it has also been a curse Finding himself unable to control his behavior, not quitting sessions when he's down or when he's playing bad, has made him realize how addicted to poker he is. As always, I'm joined by the fittest co-host in the poker industry, fellow Mechanics of Poker coach, Mr. Mindset and Performance, Adam Carmichael. Adam, being dedicated or even obsessed about the game is something I feel you need to have, at least for a part of your career in order to succeed. When, though, does it become an addiction? What would be the science and what's the problem about it? Yeah, so as you mentioned, I think being obsessed with poker is something that many players who reach high stakes can relate to early in their career in particular. And then addiction is almost when you can't stop yourself and you're seeking the pleasure of the activity and you're very compulsive with having to uh, do a behavior to get the pleasure out of it. Now, this definitely overlaps with obsession to some degree, but addiction is normally when you're kind of chasing that feeling and you're doing it without that kind of mindful intentionality over time. So I think for Frank, I'm interested to know how his obsession with poker maybe blended into addiction over time and kind of the pros and cons of that. If you're addicted to working hard, we normally say it's a good thing. If you're addicted to alcohol or substances, we often call it a bad thing. So uh, I'm curious to uh, look at Frank's journey about being obsessed with poker and basically where that led to his success and some downfalls as well. But before we start, we have teamed up with some partners in the poker industry that in our experience can help boost your poker career. First one being Universal Poker. If you are playing online poker without a good rakeback deal, you are leaving free money at the tables. This is where our partnership with Universal comes in. Whether you are making a new account or want to boost your existing account, we can give you the best deals on the market. But what sets Universal apart in today's market is carefully selecting which sites they want to work with. They only collaborate with sites that have their shit together and offer clear lines of communication with the higher ups at the site. Now, this line of communication makes them more like personal assistance for players rather than just an affiliate, which in my opinion adds a big boost to the deal in the current day industry. Visit universalpoker.com slash mechanics, link in the description below, and make sure to enter code mechanics to get exclusive deals we've arranged for our listeners. Universal poker.com slash mechanics or enter code mechanics next we have gto wizard 
If you are a frequent listener to the pod, you know that at least 90% of our guests use solvers to get ahead of the game. GTO Wizard is by far the best and most accessible tool if you want to use GTO to get ahead as well. We are proud to announce a technological breakthrough. Introducing GTO Wizard AI. This powerful technology can solve any custom poker spot in seconds to high accuracy. Unlike pre-solved solutions, this allows you to edit the solving parameters. That means you can modify the ranges, change the stack and pot sizes, customize the betting tree, and automatically simplify and optimize your bet sizes. Brace yourself. The meta is about to change. So sign up to GTO Wizard using the link below, gtowizard.com slash mechanics. Get 10% off on your first month and join the weekly coaching webinars of which one every month is with me. Looking forward to educating you guys there. But without further ado, let's get into today's episode with Frank. All right, there he is, Frank. Frank, great to have you on the pod, man. Hello, thanks very much for having me. You started playing poker 14 years ago. That's uh, it's quite a long time ago. I think I started probably in a, in a similar time. Can you take us back to your decision of going pro? Kind of what your goals and expectations about the pro poker life were and kind of your initial plan? Okay. Um, so I was at university. I was studying maths. Um, and... I'd spent maybe like one summer playing poker. Um, I hadn't made any money, but like I felt that I was like, okay, maybe I made like 500 bucks in a summer or something. And um, I was at university and I went to the like university uh, poker society. And all these guys were a bit older, you know, like three, four years older doing their masters. And they're telling me stories of like, you know, this guy made 100K last year. This guy made 150K or something. And like after a few weeks of playing with them, I could realize pretty quickly that I felt I was like as good, if not better than these guys, you know, I had no results to like show it, but when we would play together, I would just feel that I was beating them in spots or just playing better, you know? Um, and so at the end of the year of the university, I didn't do my exams and decided that I would try and do it like for a year or two professionally, see how it goes. If it went badly, come back to, university you know um but yeah i guess it went better so i never thought about coming back so it's like uh, yeah fuck it i'm young let's give it a shot i mean you don't have to really study mathematics to figure out if these guys are making 100 150k playing poker and you feel like you're <laughs> you're you're beating them that's probably a, a a decent career choice to make did like studying mathematics help you in any way starting out in in your poker career maybe help you understand the game at a better level, maybe than someone who didn't study, or maybe you have a natural lack for numbers? Yeah, I'm not sure, really. Like, I've never been one of these guys who's into, like, pod odds and, and this kind of stuff, you know. But I think in the very first, like, weeks when we, was, when we were playing with our friends, this natural mathematical intuition that I maybe have definitely helped in the first weeks, which probably allowed me to make the first step into, like, wanting to play online, you know. And then, but after that, not really, I think. You mentioned like you, um, you played against these guys and you immediately noticed that you were at least as good as them. What were kind of some indicators? For example, when I started to play poker in the beginning, it just felt like luck, right? Well, I have good cards, you have good cards. But you mentioned that you estimated their skill and you could estimate your skill already from quite an early level. Uh, how mm -hmm. were you able to do that? And what was maybe an example for like, hey, I, I make better decisions in these spots than him, for example? Yeah, so obviously this was way before solvers, right? So no one knew what was correct or what was not, obviously. But I was playing maybe like 25 or 50 an hour at the time. And I think the way I was making money was just completely running over the table, just like bulldozing every pot, just like playing like a total lunatic. Because back then games were like very nitty, you know. Um, and then I would come and play these live games with these guys that were winning all this money. And I would play pots where... Yeah, you three bet and bet the flop, bet the turn, and then it goes check, check on the river. And they've clearly had a hand that should be bluffing and has given up and, and like not, they just weren't bluffing and people weren't um, making light calls or they were just playing very, very straightforward and ABC. And yeah, I just feel some edge when I was playing, you know, and like 
people tell you their hand with their bet sizes and stuff. And even back then, I just felt that I was a little bit ahead of the other guys, I would say. Did you do any active studying? I think back then, you know, the main source of information was probably books. You read, you read any books or you kind of intuitively figured, well, if they're not bluffing and they're too tight, I should probably be bluffing a lot and not calling them. It was kind of a yeah. natural intuition you had for the game. Yeah, well, I kind of, I never read any books. I just learned the game through playing. And I started off with like sit and goes and tournaments and maybe I've got like a three, four, five K roll. And then I went to play 100 NL and instantly lost like most of it. Um, so I moved down to 25 NL and then I just kind of learned the game. I would, I would think of all the spots where I would fold and then decide, okay, if I'm folding all these spots, you know, maybe I should attack these spots as the as the defender, you know. And I would notice where people would call a lot. So maybe underbluff these spots and just kind of learn the game through how other people played it, I would say. Hmm, that's a that, that's a very interesting, interesting way of looking at it. You mentioned like you're playing Holland NL. I saw that your approach was uh Pretty high volume to say the least. I I got linked to like a, I think it was a two plus two post two thousand eleven. That's quite a long time ago. You were going pro. You said I will be playing two hundred to three hundred k hands of hundred NL per month whilst learning six max and studying the game a ton. Where do you find the time, man? Studying the game a ton, playing two hundred three hundred k hands. Yeah, well, you know, if it's all you do, it's it's quite easy actually. I thought, and when I was younger. Or even until recently, poker was all I all I did, you know, like I really lived the game. Like you wake up, have breakfast, play for 12 hours, maybe have one more meal for the day, go to sleep sometimes, sometimes play another session, you know, and just when it's all you do, it's quite easy to get the volume in, to be honest. And back then it was 24 tables, you know, because it was full ring on poker stars and stuff. So what in your opinion are like the pros and maybe also the cons of trying to always focus on high volume uh, throughout your experience? Um, yeah, I never really thought about it when I first started. You know, I just I would just play as many tables as I, as I could get up to. And I think 24 is the limit. And so it just felt like the, the right amount for me. And um, I always got into this flow state, I've got to say. Like when you have so many tables that you don't have any time for decisions i know it sounds strange but like you don't have time to think really because you're going to time out near the table so your brain kind of automatically processes all the information and you're just like almost in this this flow state like you're on drugs or something i would always be in that and to get into that state i'd need at least like i don't know 12 plus tables like if you don't have enough tables you just you can't reach it and i would find myself coming bored or not paying attention or something um but I guess I never really played less tables. I tried playing six tables for a video recently. And like, you know, you're never even in any hands. You're just sitting there doing nothing. Like it was very boring for me. I couldn't focus at all. I I, I can get that. Then basically your mind wanders and then you have a decision and suddenly you have to sort of refocus back to poker. Whereas if you constantly have decisions, you your mind does not get distracted off poker. Mm -hmm. I guess also you don't really, you don't then then don't really have a problem with like overthinking, for example, right? Because there's no time to overthink. It's just your first gut feeling, your first intuition, that's what you do. And then you straight away move to the, the next hand. Um, pretty much. You know, in, in big spots, of course, I'll try and think things through. Um, but I've always, I guess, been an intuition player. I'd say I've had quite a good baseline, especially after Solvers came out. Like I had a, a fairly good baseline and then, but I would always go with my intuitions, I guess. Um, as weird as that sounds. No, it's not. Uh, it's, it's 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 not weird at all. Uh, I can imagine, for example, if I speak from my experience, like my intuition, if I'm really good in touch with it, it's it's spot on. But there's definitely times where I'm maybe a little bit tilted or don't play as well, and then my intuition can be quite biased. How do you take in? How can I say in consideration if you, for example, slightly tilted or that's in some spots your intuition is quite biased? How do you try to override that? Yeah, so like I guess if I'm in a spot um, where I know, because I always try and think of poker as like kind of attack and defense, right? If you're the opener or the three better, you're playing attack. If you're the 
baller, you're playing defense kind of. And when I'm playing the defense lines, I try to just play kind of close to what I think is GTO, you know, try to like uh, not be exploited and like call the right things. And let's say you've, you've called 10 rivers in a row and like lost 10 stacks, right? Even though you think all the hands are like good calls. And then it's, it's the 11th time, right? When it happens and the guy shoves and then you're sitting there thinking like, oh, I've lost 10 stacks in a row. You know, my intuition is telling me we've got to fold this one, but you know that it's going to be a plus EV call or you know the guy's over bluffing. So you're going to call again. And these are kind of the times where I feel I have to fight my intuition because it's, it's telling me to fold based on experience, just like when you're in a downswing or something. But if if it's going well and I'm running normally or, or going well, then I'll just follow the intuition and not have to fight it really, I think. When you mentioned earlier about, you know, you know the spots where people would not bluff, call too much, call too little. Is it like a an unconscious process just by playing so many volume or is it like something that you review your session afterwards or when it came down to the to the you know the bias that you have do you like set intentions before or is it just like i wake up i start grinding get in the flow and during the grind is when i learn and when i review basically you do playing reviewing everything in the in the session or is there like something active after or before um so when i first started let's say the first four or five years of poker um, it was all just in the session. There was no solvers and I would just be be grinding and playing and I would notice, you know, like you, you check raise a spot, bet the turn, shove the river and 10 times in a row, you don't, you never get called by one pair, for example, you know, you just, you get called by sets or they fold the river. So I'd start to think, okay, maybe people are folding more than they should in this spot. So just start like going completely out of line, you know, like, like really completely like check raising five, four suited on queen, 10, seven, and just betting the turn, shoving the river and like having no idea how to play the game basically, but um, thinking it was an overfolded spot. So attacking it. And I would kind of learn that in the game. And then I had one very good friend from poker, Steve, who um, we kind of, he kind of taught me a little bit of like, you know, you don't need to have five, four suited here. You could have a seven or you could have a pair or like kind of taught me to be a bit more in line. And then with him, after my sessions, I would really study all of the hands or like talk through them and try and like learn away from the tables. It's funny when you said I didn't know how to play the game. I mean, we could have we could have a different various arguments here because like I would say on one side, if like you you your intuition says there's no full spot, so you start expanding your range, right? Mm -hmm. Five four suited on Queen Ten Seven indeed seems probably one of the last hands, but hey, you know. You, you thought it was over full of spot. You went just mass exploit. And that's, I guess, how your intuition gathers data, right? You want to know, you want to get as much information about the spot. So by going completely out of line and then maybe recalibrating after that, if you start to see loose calls, it is a way, I guess, to train your intuition as fast as possible. I guess this Steve guy he probably also learned something from you, right? Where he is maybe too in line in some situations. So I guess you guys, you know, were like the yin yang. In, in, yeah, in the poker team we had a very a very good balance actually um learn a lot from each other but yeah i really credit a lot of my success to him for sure um because he already had like a poker crew and stuff and i was just by myself and he kind of took me in and like we climbed through the stakes together we did eventually both get banned on poker stars together but like we still it was a very very net positive definitely what happened there? I know, I know you were Maya the Dunn back back in the days. That's for example, you're currently playing on the name Mr. Bilderman, and I was yeah. uh, actually it was George George Frogret uh, who, who recommended to 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 reach out to you and to have you on. Uh, and then he said Mr. Bilderman. I was like, okay, yeah, sure, I'll reach out. And then he said Maya the Dunn. I was like, oh Maya the Dunn, yeah, that guy I do know, you know, as a fellow yeah. fellow old school old school poker player. Uh, what what happened there? Um, yeah, so I eventually left my university and decided to live in the house with Steve and we were both grinding all day every day playing 200 and L just playing infinite tables and we both decided all right you know what we're going to do supernova elite move up um in fact black friday happened so it created this hole in mid stakes like all the american regs were gone so the games were really good so i moved up in this time started playing some 400 some 600 some 1k even um and at the time, me and Steve were playing on the same tables. Um, 
which I guess you you obviously weren't allowed to, but we had two internets living in the same house. And we were playing the same tables. And when I was first playing 1K, I remember maybe I had like 20 or 30K at the time, maybe a bit more. And then one day I either won or lost like 5K to Steve, you know, and it was like a lot of money at the time. And I remember finishing the session and going down to like talk to him and like, he wasn't mad or neither of us was mad, but it was just, it was uncomfortable, you know, like we spent the whole time talking and learning together and like studying together. And then it created this, this dynamic that just wasn't nice to like live in, you know? So eventually we decided we're going to be playing all day, every day with each other, you know, like winning loads from each other. And it was just, it was uncomfortable. So we decided that we just weren't going to play pots against each other. And I was maybe 19 at the time, you know, like I didn't have other poker friends. I, I hadn't really thought about the consequences of this, you know, like if he opened, I would only three back with like top 2%, you know, and I, I thought, or we thought at the time, we were just avoiding each other without realizing the effect that it would have on the other players, you know? So of course we were soft playing. Um, we were never doing anything bad or like squeezing guys out of pots. We just like weren't playing against each other. Mm. And obviously, obviously in reflection, it was completely against the rules or whatever, but we just hadn't thought about it, I suppose. And then we got, we made Supernova Elite and eventually we got an email saying that we've been banned and it turned into a funds taken, perma ban. And it was a pretty tough time to be honest, but um, yeah, probably a fair punishment looking back, but yeah. Yeah, it sounds like the reason why they have that rule in place was definitely not the reason you guys started to do it, right? How do yeah. you, like, throughout your career, how have you maybe learned? Obviously, so so you tried soft playing in hindsight, or at least you didn't know it was soft playing and you didn't know, you know, it was it was uh, not TOS approved. How did you learn to deal with uh, being friends with basically your competitors, right? Because poker is very unique in that way because you share mm -hmm. information, you try to make each other better, you're like colleagues, but in the same time, you're also competitors. How have you uh, evolved to deal with it and how do you deal with it maybe up until today? Um, I actually completely stopped playing against any of my friends or like guys I lived with and never played with again. Like after the ban, me and Steve went to party poker you know, we were both we were both pretty down, I guess, because we felt we were young and we had this huge opportunity to win like infinite money doing Supernova Elite and it had been taken away. Um, but then we went to party poker and we were very serious about it. We would like never play the same tables. We would we would have shifts, you know, like he could play the good night games one week and I would play the day games and then we would switch it every week. Um, and this lasted for a few years. Um but like now, for example, I'd never want to play against George. I, I don't like playing against Daryl. Obviously, he plays a bit higher now. And um, I just never enjoyed playing pots against your friends because, you know, if you win, sure, you're kind of happy, but like not really. And then if you lose, you're like kind of pissed. So like you can never really win. So, yeah, I try to avoid it at all costs. That's interesting because I can imagine like, I've I've had this feeling and when it's a significant amount, so for example, you said you had like a 20, 30K rule and you take 5K of someone and it's your friend, then I can understand it's not very uncomfortable. But let's say, you know, you have a million and you take 5K of someone, then like for yeah, me, sure. at least my experience, you know, it doesn't hurt him financially. And that's, I think, when I know at least it doesn't hurt him financially, you know, and he's going to be fine, right? He's going to be able to go to the supermarket, get, get some food. Uh, that, for me, that for me, it's fine. Uh, and then actually it's there's some room for like a bit of competitiveness in me that I actually like to play against guys that I know because it becomes kind of a competitive game. You, you don't have like the same competitive spark in you? Um, no, I definitely have the competitive spark um, when it comes to, let's say, like winning money for the year or, or the month or whatever or or just playing generally well. But... I think probably because I'm so scarred by this incident with Steve, you know, it really just put me off playing against friends. Like even now when I play against guys who I know a little bit, like we're not even close friends, but like I know a little bit from bit B, maybe we met once or twice. I don't, I really just prefer not to play against them, you know, because like I just don't enjoy winning money from guys that I know somehow, but that's just my way of seeing it, I guess. So for example, if you, uh, 
uh, let, let's say you go play sports with George. No, no side betting going on. You don't like take money from your friends. Um, Ooh. Nah, this is, this is actually different. This is different. We like George doesn't ever lose bets. Like never, ever. So it's nice to occasionally beat him in bets. But um, he normally takes very plus EV bets. But like I, I like to bet with my friends. Somehow it's just poker is different, you know. All right, all right. It took you, uh, I think you mentioned, took you around roughly three years to get to like the 500 and 1K level, which is actually the level that you've grinded throughout your career. It's definitely something we're going to touch on later. In those three years, do you remember any big highs? I mean, I was also going to ask lows, but I'm pretty sure the low you've just mentioned, right? The the the, the getting banned, that was definitely your low. Any any big highs in, in, in that period, moving up to 510? Um, I guess it was, it was nice when, as funny as it sounds, it was nice when Black Friday happened because I got to move up and play some higher games. I was very against this at first. I didn't want to do it, but Steve had been playing them and he actually even put me on a stake for, for Christmas, I think for the week of Christmas. And he was like, yeah, you can have half the action and play these bigger games. And, you know, I was scared. There was like, it was guys like God of Heads Up there, you know, like I didn't want to play against these guys, these monsters, you know. And then I played for a week and realized, you know, okay, these guys aren't actually monsters, you know, they're just scary names that win a lot of money. And then after that, yeah, it felt pretty good. Um, but then I was just playing 200, 400, 600, and it was a very, very consistent, steady grind, you know, nothing, um, nothing huge until I started playing higher stakes and then had some bad experiences, I guess. Oh, yeah. When you grind the same stakes for uh, this long, as, as you have, right? You've grinded like 500 to 1K, probably for like 10, no, probably more like 12, 13, 14 years. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've seen certain trends come and go. Any interesting metas that has happened over the year that stand out to you? Um. Yeah, so for the first, like, I guess five, six years, the games were just very, very, very folded. The, the way you kind of won was like how much you could fold, you know. Um, people with three bit pocket aces and just bet the flop and check fold the turn because the other guy was only going to have sets when he bet, you know, in these four in games, um, which of, of course you could massively exploit by, um, of course. And then after five or six years, maybe some solvers started to come out. And then the games changed quite heavily and became very sticky. And guys, bluffing was just not really working anymore. And guys were calling down with, with hands you wouldn't expect. And then as the years have progressed and like GDO Wizard has become like a big thing, even now, like the nitty guys are finding some, some bodied lines or some calls or some bluffs, you know, and I think you just have to be much, much sharper now. And there's these like MDA... Brazilian guys showed up, you know, you have to play very specific way against, you know, and yeah, these, of course, these never existed back in the day. So, yeah. So the, the current, me the current meta, how, how would you describe the current meta? I'd say the current meta is very sticky. Um, guys love, guys don't really like bluffing so much. They, they, they bluff more than they used to, but they still, people still like the human psychology is adverse to bluffing, right? But now people are quite happily calling. And it's very strange because so many people play this style where they don't like bluffing, but they love calling for some reason because they think... I think I always used to think that everyone projected, you know, like if I was a guy who was bluffing a lot and playing very aggressively, you think everyone else is. And then the guys who are very nitty just think that everyone else is nitty and this is the way the game should be played. But then, so I never really understood why all these guys hate bluffing but love calling. Um, it just seemed to be a trend. Yeah, I remember, like, I, I always felt like the best stats would be you yourself are very aggressive. And then when people are aggressive, you like to do a lot of folding, right? That that makes most sense because that's how, you know, said there's no projection going on. You have a clear, conscious, conscious strategy. Um, Adam, I want to hand it over to you. I'm sure he already touched on a couple of topics that I'm sure you would love to dive into. So, uh I, I have to control myself here not to ask too many questions and I still still too much questions away from you. So uh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm intrigued to dive in with your high volume and how you, uh, first of all, 
went into that kind of grind and then how you've been able to optimize it over the years. So it sounds like almost from the off, you went into multi-tabling, long hours. I'm curious to know, um, did, was there anything that set you up for that? Did you do any gaming in the past? How were you uh, able to jump straight into poker and do a lot of tables? Or was there a transition to uh, your kind of multi-tabling approach? No, I used to play computer games or Xbox 360, at like a fairly high level. Um, never anything professional, but I, took, I used to take it pretty seriously. And we had some clans and stuff. And I did notice already that I was very, like a lot more obsessive than my friends. You know, they would play their three, four games and I would be there playing all night and just all weekend and never stopping and really trying to improve and stuff. Um, and then when I started playing poker, I guess I just always played as many tables as I felt I could manage because I just thought it's like, you're going to have more money if you're winning on more tables. Um, and back then, everything was full ring. So it was nine handed. And the game I just thought was pretty slow. Like you don't really raise in the early positions. And so I would just get as many tables as I could. And back then it just happened to be 24 on Poker Stars. Like I probably would have played more if it was possible. Um, and then as I moved up the stakes, I was learning about Supernova Elite, you know, and like how much you had to play and how many, how much you had to rake and stuff. And I would do the calculations and think, okay, maybe this could be possible even at 100 NL or definitely at 200 NL. And then as I became more of a consistent winner and established in the 200 games, I thought, okay, you know, I can actually do this, you know, like all I have to do is play these 5K hands a day or whatever. And like, I, I can do it. So I just fixated on that, I suppose at first yeah i'm guessing for you you've just got very much into the process of playing high volume multi-tabling just waking up showing up and just putting in lots and lots of volume for yourself mm -hmm. like did you find the grind draining at all like you're playing long hours i'm guessing not much breaks um loads of tables for you was that a sustainable grind from the off because i know other players who uh, maybe try the multi-tabling high volume approach they'll run into problems with fatigue burnout mental drain for you did you have any of those issues um not at all actually not for the first 10 years of my career probably like when i first started i could play all day every day and then you know i go to sleep and i'm dreaming of poker i'm like playing hands in my sleep you know like moving the mouse around but sometimes i've got five cards or whatever and i'm just i'm i'm dreaming of poker in my sleep and then i wake, wake up and one minute later start a session you know online and just like just permanent poker for weeks and weeks and weeks and that's just like how it was and i guess i had this intense passion or something at first like real like burning desire and like when i wasn't there i was thinking about it and i just wanted to play all the time um and of course that fades but for me it took very long it wasn't until maybe 10 years or so when i had my first burnout so what was this burning desire that was driving you to play and think about poker every hour i'm actually not sure i never I never really questioned it. I just play I, I, from a very young age, of course, I always wanted to be successful. And then I guess I kind of found this opportunity and saw how successful you can be. And I, I liked the, the fact that it's just at the end of the day, it's just you versus you, you know, like the guy who works harder in poker is going to have the most success. And I kind of enjoyed that feeling of like, you put more in, you get more out. Um, and I mean, I always had problems with, with losses when I was losing. I had definitely entitlement tilt or something, and I would want to get my money back somehow. And this is really when the, like, the very long sessions started, I would say, when I was losing. What are the, what are the very long sessions in your framing? <laughs> um, so yeah, I would start out, I'm playing 200 NL, and maybe you lose 10 buy-ins. And then I play the whole night, and until the like 12 o'clock the next day one two or something and then you go back to even and i would be like okay you know got back to even got some break back money it's okay sleep three hours until 5 p.m and then like start grinding again when i was at university um and this would happen like quite regularly and then i got into this mindset of like you know if you keep playing you will get the money back it doesn't matter like of course you can go to bed but like you don't have to if you keep playing it will come back and after you do it 10 20 times you it really gets fixated in your head and then yeah it got to a point where i was playing 
and I used to play a bit of a splashy style and I don't I wasn't a very good player and I was I was losing like 35 buy-ins at 200 now in one session um and I've been playing for five six hours and somehow in my head I was like you know if you keep playing it will come back and this session ended up being 50 52 hours or something I played like foot round the clock twice like two times no didn't stop for any food or anything I had some Lucas aids or whatever and like at the end you know I did get back to zero I did grind it all the way back and then went upstairs saw my friends they were like where have you been for the last two days and I was like yeah I was, I was just grinding you know like fell asleep on the sofa and then woke up the next day started grinding again it's just it's just how it was I just loved it wow that is that's extreme grinding I'm surprised the mind is able to uh function for that many hours with the amount of tables you're playing I don't know how many decisions you would have made in that kind of time frame but it would have been very very extreme so I'm wondering like in these states there's there's obviously an element of high volume will even out variance over time but then there's mm -hmm. also the uh, kind of counter arguments that when you're in a compromised state and you're kind of chasing losses you're playing bad pocket so for you like what was kind of some of the trade-offs you were making because I'm guessing there's a lot of sessions where these things were happening you started badly and you played longer and you put in lots of volume how would you say that like affected your overall win rates or what were some of the uh, maybe errors you made in your strategy or challenges you faced when you're playing high volume chasing these losses um i think when you when i was down a lot in these sessions i would always try and increase the variance when i was playing you know just like three bird five birding hands that could be calling and just really pushing max variance um, but I, I did believe that, you know, not having losing sessions is going to help your win rate overall. But in, when I look back at it, I think if I'd, whenever I was down 10 buy-ins, if I just quit and gone to bed and then played again the next day and sort of restarted the, the hole from there, I would have had a much better win rate overall. Um, and like when I would look back through these 20 k hand sessions or this 50k hand session that i played you know i'm looking back and there's there's 30 stacks that you've punted off you know and um i think if i was fresher or more focused or playing less tables this would never have happened but it was just my approach and it was just all i ever knew so i never really thought about doing anything different to be honest yeah did you have any troubles or challenges when you try to uh like maybe take time off. I'm sure you've experimented with things over the 14 years of, should I play through this volume? It seems like your default is to just grind, grind yourself out of a hole. I'm guessing for you, like maybe the thought of taking some time off, taking a day off, taking an early day would have found some resistance. So did, did you find any challenges from taking any time off from poker? Um, yes, huge challenges. I've always found it very difficult. Um, I used to have a rule that like if I lost... 10 buy-ins and like I couldn't get out of the hole and I did this like three or four days in a row then I would I would be forced to take a day off but you know in these days off I would I would just be sitting around like just thinking about it and like really just wanting to get back to start playing and I used to find taking holidays pretty difficult because poker was always in, in my brain or whatever I just wanted to play and thinking okay while I'm not playing, other guys are getting better or playing or winning leaderboards or whatever it was. Um, and if I'd been losing, let's say I was down 20 buy-ins for the month and I had a holiday tomorrow, I would find it very, very difficult to go on this holiday because I would feel like, you know, I haven't earned it. I've, I've been losing. Like I, I want to get back, back to even or whatever before I take my holiday. And this was always like a really big problem for me and had huge impacts actually in life. I would have to feel it somehow earned it. You know, I couldn't zoom out and see the thousands of buy-ins that I'd won before. It was just very focused on the short term. That's very interesting. Yeah, you mentioned having earned it and it feels like you're getting some of your self-worth from your achievements in poker and the volume you're playing. And you're almost like dicing that up into um, small segments as well, winning weeks, winning months, winning days, mm -hmm. rather than like looking at the bigger picture. So for you, like in terms of when you were trying to get balance i'm guessing at some point you didn't you didn't always just play every single day and, and not stop for a minute when you try to get some balance did you uh, notice like as you mentioned like your self-worth was challenging like you didn't feel like you uh, were worthy of days off worthy of taking breaks and like how did you find balance i'm asking this question because i feel like there's a kind of gift and a curse you've got here where you're a machine mm -hmm. playing high volume then also you're trying to uh, 
be happy, live a good life, do things away from the poker tables. And every time you want to take a break, poker pulls you back in because like, you feel like that's how you get validated. So for you, I'm wondering how uh, you managed to find space in the last 14 years to do things away from poker. Um, yeah, to be honest, it sounds kind of sad, but like I never, I haven't found this balance. Um, I've never been able to find it. It's been something I've been speaking with, with my therapist about um, for the last few years, um, trying to find ways to find this balance. But like all the trips I used to take when not with my girlfriends, but with like poker guys, it was always poker trips, you know, so it was fine with they have computers there and you can go to Mexico for six months, but when you're playing 10 hours of poker every day, you know, it's like, sure, it's a trip, but it's still it's still work, you know, and um for the first, let's say, 10, 12 years of my career, maybe 10, I was very happy. But not not happy, but like I didn't mind that I didn't have a balance. So I was just like, you know, I'm all in. This is what it takes to be successful. This is how it should be. This is, I'm doing the right thing. But then as I got, you know, to 29, 30, I didn't really want to live this way anymore. But, you know, I couldn't. Like I would, I would say, okay, I'm going to play three hours of setting alarms, you know, like George is telling me, okay, set an alarm when it goes off, no matter what happens, you quit. And I would set my alarm for three hours. I'm down eight buy-ins, uh, recreational players everywhere, 20 tables of GG, throw the phone into the corner, you know, next next time I like come around, it's 10 in the morning, you know, and I like, you know, I really did feel like some kind of addict or whatever. It was like really, like like I'm not even there and I was completely incapable of stopping the sessions and, I don't know I just couldn't find the balance at all so right now I'm I'm complete cold turkey just no playing at all while I'm trying to make some disciplines in other areas and find some other passions and stuff and hopefully when I come back maybe the desires to do the other things that I like will be strong enough to keep me from staying up all night and playing poker um mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, although you've struggled with balance, you've definitely not struggled with volume throughout your career. So I want to transition into uh, how you how to master the high volume grind. So for you, you're someone who obviously naturally has a gravitation towards wanting to play. But there's a lot of players now who chase leaderboards on GG or chase high rate back deals and want to want to master their their own high volume for themselves. What are some of the lessons you've learned throughout your high volume career of things that work effectively in terms of being able to maximize your output of volume on a daily basis that you could maybe relate to the audience? Um, yeah, I think if you want to be like a, a high volume guy and, you know, I've always thought that people should decide, do you want to play high volume mid stakes or do you want to play high stakes? Like these are the... If you want to make a lot of money, these are the two approaches. You can't be one of these guys that just plays small volume mid stakes because sure, you're going to win some money, but you're never going to win a lot of money. Um, so if you really want to play and like go down the road that I did, which I wouldn't really recommend, but you really want to play high volume, first thing you need to have simple strategies. You can't be getting too complex and playing six different bet sizes on the turn and stuff and just like, play simple strategies, range bet wherever you can and stuff. Um, and, you know, also in the pool that you're playing, really try and find a way, look at the look at the biggest winners in this pool, try and see what they are doing well and really try and find a way to maxim maximally exploit whichever pool that you're playing in. Because, you know, at mid stakes, no one is playing well. So there's ways to have huge win rates, even if you're playing like a lot of tables and yeah. Great advice. And how does your routine and consistency on a daily basis help with high volume? If you're doing this amount of hours, I'm guessing you had some sort of structure to your days. So could you talk us through uh, how your days would look on these high volume days, weeks, years? Yeah, I mean, when I, was, when I was younger, it was wake up, have breakfast, grind the whole day, have, some, have something to eat, uh, go to bed for years and years. But then as I got a bit older, you know, and I was trying to do some fitness or do some things in the evening, I would try and play one session in the afternoon, take a break, have some food, get prepared for the night, and then play the big long session in the night and see like where it went. Yeah. How long were these sessions? Uh, I try and play three, four hours in the afternoon. And then the evening session, yeah, let's say I started eight or nine i would try and play until one or two 
but I was very open to myself that like if it was going badly or if the games were good, I can play till midday. Like it's no problem. Like I I was I was prepared for it. You mentioned doing more fitness stuff, and I've I've heard that you were recently doing a fitness challenge. Mm -hmm. How has that impacted your life overall? But in terms of poker, your ability to concentrate, your energy levels. Yeah, when did, when's that been a, a part of your life, and how has it had an impact? Um, I even when I was grinding a lot, I was trying to stay a little bit active and do at least a couple things a week, you know. Um, and I would say this is actually like the one piece of advice I would give to the young guys or people playing a lot of volume is to try and stay physically active. I always had my best results when I was going to the gym and not like super super hyper obsessed um, with poker. It definitely helped. Um, and now I feel very clear, you know, cause you get this brain fog from grinding and like, it really does disappear when you go to the gym and stuff. So I really recommend it. Yeah. yeah. And at the moment you're doing some fitness challenge where I heard it's like two workouts a day. Could you give us a little bit of insights onto what that is and what the goal is? Yeah. So since I was in Asia or the last year or so, I've really been focusing on fitness and, and health in general and stuff. And now that I'm not playing any poker at all, I have all this time in my day and I need another obsession to obsess over. So I just set myself this goal where for 75 days, I have to do two workouts every day and eat like a super strict diet and, you know, just do it. Like it sucks, but just do it. And it's like, it's hard. And I just wanted to do something hard. It's probably not the best way of training or anything like that. I just wanted to do something mentally and physically tough. You know, like when you've done one workout, it's cold outside, you don't want to go out, but you just do it anyway. I think this is very important and it, it helps you build confidence and discipline and all these like important things. So I like it. Stepping into hard things to kind of build character. There's a challenge called the 75 hard. I'm not sure you've yeah. heard that one. It's very, it's, I'm doing something very similar, but just not allowing any like walking or any exercises like this, like trying to do it a bit tougher. But yeah, yeah. amazing. And what are some of the benefits you've noticed from that? I'm only a week or so in, but um, mm -hmm. I'm just feeling pretty pretty positive about it. It feels nice. It's, I enjoy doing something hard. It's it's kind of how I always approach poker anyway. And like, mm -hmm. I know that I'm just removing poker and replacing it with another addiction. And like, I talk mm -hmm. about this with my therapist and like, I'm aware of it, but it's just for now, it's okay. It's hopefully not going to be forever. And I'm hoping by the end of the challenge, I'm like so in love with fitness that when I start a session and I'm losing five buy-ins, I think, oh shit, I've got to go to sleep now because I've got some workouts tomorrow. My body needs to be strong. Um, I'm just hoping that this feeling is stronger than the addiction to whatever whatever I have with poker. And, you know, it's a, it's a rogue approach or whatever, but I've tried a lot of other things. So why not? Let's see how it goes. It's also fairly healthy for the time being, so... We'll see how it goes. Yeah, it's interesting to look at addiction and basically I, I class addiction as compulsive behaviors that you can't stop yourself from doing and you feel mm. like the need to do them that is very strong. And the certain addictions that we class as good, if you're working a lot, it's like workaholic, go him, yeah, yeah, yeah. be in the gym all the time. It's like, wow, he's in great shape. And even though the addiction might be similar, some forcing you to do the behavior, society kind of gives thumbs up to certain ones and thumbs down to other ones. But as you kind of notice, like almost any addiction, when you take it too far, becomes a negative. Whether you're a workaholic, mm -hmm. whether you're a gymaholic, whatever it is, like, it becomes a negative. So uh, for you in terms of addiction, addictive tendencies, is this been something you've struggled on, struggled with your whole life? Have you had other addictions prior to poker? And yeah, talk us through like how uh, that addiction feels. Because I always feel like there's a lot to understand about yourself when you're trying to understand the behaviors, what's driving them. So in terms of first question is, have you always had addictive tendencies in your personality and where did they first show up? Um, yeah, I would say so. You know, when I was a kid, I was like, I would, I would study for like exams that like didn't even matter, you know, like you're 16, these exams don't mean anything. And I would be studying five hours a night, just like kind of, hello, kind of addictive to this stuff or whatever. Um, and then I discovered computer games and was super addicted into this stuff, like, very very addicted um went to university started playing poker just super addictive into this like very very like narrow um line of vision just it was just all about this and i don't know I, I guess i always thought that that's what it required to be successful that was just how i thought about it when i thought about these successful guys who like maybe i wanted to be like 
I, th I thought, you know, that's what they did. That's how they got it. You know, they're not naturally any better than me. They just pinholed and super focused. And so I'm going to do the same, you know? Mm. Yeah, it's like all you can think about. And it's like an obsession, but like maybe taken even further to like an extreme obsession. Uh, so for you, in terms of why do you think you were addicted to certain things? What do you think like created that necessity? Because I always feel like there's a driver behind it. So uh, let's go back to like kind of college days or university. Uh, what became... Why do you think your brain got so fixated on one thing and had to like kind of binge through stuff? Um, yeah, I'm not sure why it happened. Um, I think it, it's probably something to do with with poker and, and even gambling, maybe. Because, you know, a lot of guys have, well, not a lot, but people have gambling problems. And maybe I had a, a gambling problem, but just happened to be a good player, you know, so maybe I was lucky um but there is something about how the brain works and when you when you when you lose your your money you you want it back somehow you have this feeling and like i remember some of the clients had roulette in there you know and one day first time i lost 5k or something i'm sitting there in the client and i'm like looking at the roulette wheel and thinking you know one click and i could have my money back you know i never clicked that button and i made sure to get rid of everything and I'm very, very happy. Probably the best decision I ever made, actually, to not click that button. Um, but I felt some something within me, like, wanted to do it, you know, like, really strong urge. And so I, I definitely understand these people that lose their houses gambling or, or whatever, you know. I, 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 you know, it's people say, like, yeah, you have to be an addict to understand an addict or whatever. And mm -hmm. a lot of poker players, like, all of my close friends, they've never had these issues, I think, with poker. But somehow I just really felt it so this is quite interesting for me because i know in the questionnaire we, we give you uh, you mentioned you were someone who uh, likes to plan ahead and weren't really like a gambler so to speak and also you're someone who kind of stayed at mid stakes rather than go to high stakes which i'm guessing like, it like, came from maybe risk aversion but also from uh, the just the profitability of playing high volume at the mid stakes mm -hmm. so um, i'm wondering with you uh, how much you uh, feel like the gambling nature you've had to uh, hold in or restrain and how much you've um, yeah, naturally been able to just gravitate away from making high risk choices whilst going through your career. Yeah, I did. I definitely felt that when I only play back then, when I play 200 NL or now when I play 500 or 1K, you know, nothing can go that bad. Whereas if I'm playing 5K or playing 10K and these feelings take over, you know, I could see things going very badly. I'm, I'm not sure it would, but like when I think about my poker career, I kind of always thought about like a 10 year plan. You know, if I play a million, 1.5 million hands a year in these games, I'm going to win this much money and it's going to happen every time. But then if I play in 5K, I'm playing 10K, maybe I'm a winner at first, but then maybe it starts going badly and some feelings take over and all of a sudden I've lost 20 buy-ins playing 10K, you know, and like, because this happens, I played 500, I lose 20 buy-ins, you know, it could happen in these games. And then I would start to have a big problem, you know. So I guess I always thought it could happen. It might not, but I tried to stay away from it just for the fact that it could happen. And of course, it, it would... Sorry, you go ahead. No, very interesting. Yeah, so it sounds like you said nothing can go that bad in mid-stakes. And it almost feels like this self-preservation. You like you realize losing 10, 20 buying swings at the higher stakes, you realize with your personality how that could cause you to unravel a bit. And mm -hmm. this is very interesting as well. You mentioned like having this kind of 10-year plan. And I'm guessing for you, uh, you wanted like a low risk. 10 year plan where you could play high volume and almost not predict your winnings, but within a range, I'm guessing for you, uh, compared to most players, your probability is quite predictable in terms of the amount of hands you're going to play. Um, mm -hmm. So you wanted that kind of low risk approach. So did you ever have any uh, temptations to play higher or was this the clear path and you were stuck to the path from day one and just played high volume at mid stakes without even thinking about playing higher? Um, I probably played a few million hands of low and mid stakes before I thought about playing high stakes but you know I'd, I had thought like it could be fun to play there you know and like once I started to build up a little bit of a role I did take some shots but then I had a very bad experience one day um playing like 5k and stuff and after that I was put off for a very long time and didn't come back for some years yeah can we go into that experience what happened to 5k's yeah sure so I guess I've been playing for 
this is my first like proper professional year. I'd, I'd had like a half year after I dropped out of university and this was my first one. And I think maybe I, I was only playing 200, a bit of 400. And I got up to, I maybe had like a 100K roll at this point. Like I never cashed out. I just had it in there. I don't know why, what I was doing. I just kept it there. Just, I like seeing the number go up, you know. And then um, there used to be this famous guy, maybe you know him, Waco, uh, Scout, 326 or whatever. Yes, I know Scout. Yeah. So like he was playing some some games, some 5K games, 15 guys on the wait or whatever, some 2K games. And I just I joined the wait list for fun, you know. And then all of a sudden, four hours later, I get the seat and he's still there, you know, at all these tables. And I've got all the money in my account and I'm like talking to Steve and I'm like, man, shall I have a go? Shall I have a go? And he's like, fuck it, mate, scouts there, you know, and we jump in and I'm playing two tables, 5K, two tables, 2K, some 1K games, and then like a bunch of 200 and tables on the side. Um, and yeah, it goes pretty badly. Maybe I lose like 20K or something and then scout leaves and then... Me and Steve are like, oh, his scout's gone. And, but I've got this feeling of like, I've just lost 20K, you know, like I'm not going anywhere. So I like keep playing. I'm sitting there playing with the regs and like obviously guys who are infinitely better than me and some fish come and go and then just keep playing, keep playing, keep playing. And then eventually I'm so tired. It's like eight in the morning and I've lost like 40, 45K or something. And I close my session and then I'm, I'm just, everyone else is asleep. And I remember just like sitting there feeling like, really really not good you know and like everything until this point had been going so well and then I'd lost like almost half of my money in one day like completely spiraled out of control um I just remember going to have breakfast and feeling like very very low um didn't know what to do you know like wishing you could have some kind of time machine to like go back or whatever or I just I didn't even have anyone I could speak to about it you know I couldn't call my mom and say hey I just lost more than your year's salary yesterday. Like, I don't know how to, how to I just didn't know what to do. Um, and I didn't have any high stakes friends or anything. Like, I spoke to Steve about it, but neither of us had experienced something like this. Um, and so I felt very, very low. And this feeling stuck with me like a, a very long time. I felt like a, a gambling addict or something, you know, because until this point, it was very, very consistent. I win 300 bucks every single day, you know. And then, yeah, this happened and... It was very negative and I decided, okay, firstly, I'm just going to play 200 for the next three months until I have all my money back, which did happen. You know, I sat there and I played 15 hours a day for three months and got back to where I was. Um, and then I decided to just stay away from high stakes for a, a very long time. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So it feels like this experience, uh, the negative uh, effects of it almost had a... Uh direct impact on your whole career in terms of the decisions you made you went to play like more mid stakes and you st stayed playing high volume there and almost didn't want to risk like that kind of what happened there it almost felt like it got out of control and you just didn't even yeah just understand what went on during that frame you almost got caught in this addictive like tendencies just playing too much and almost like not blacked out but have this kind of um almost missed come over you yeah can you can you remember that session like like going back to it can you remember like how you felt playing because it feels like once you've quit your session there's been a realization of oh shit what have i just done mm -hmm. but like in the midst of it i'm guessing there was other things going on so how, how are you feeling like during this like emotion wise yeah i mean i can remember it very well bro i can remember hands that i played in this session um and yeah i just remember like because, you know, now when you lose 5K, it's just like, yeah, I've lost it a thousand times, you know, whatever, who cares? But like back then, I probably never lost more than a, a couple hundred bucks, you know, in a pot. And then I'm getting stacked at 5K and you're like, you're, you're thinking like, man, 5,000 bucks in one hand has just gone and you like can't believe it or whatever. But then I was thinking, you know, maybe in 10 minutes I play another pot where the 5K comes back. You know, I really wanted to like get the money back somehow. I, I should have had some stop loss. I should have had this. I should have had that. But I just, I really felt like, like wrapped in. And, mm -hmm. you know, when you're playing for this, at the time, big money, it does feel like very exciting. And you have these huge dopamine and adrenaline rushes. And like, you bluff the river and the guy falls and you feel like your heart is bursting out of your chest. And it's like, it's very fun and exciting. So um, I can understand how it happened. And I, I also learned a lot from this session, you know, like, after this session, when I would play my 200 tables and I would lose 1K, it didn't feel so bad, you know? So it was like, it was pretty good. Mm. How did this affect like the coming months? So you mentioned going back to 200s to kind of grind 
back some of the role for a number of months. How does this affect your mindset? I know when people have lost a lot of money and they've got to especially go down much lower stakes and it's going to take a long time to get that money back from that one day session. How is this affecting how you're approaching your days and also your, your state of mind during the following months? Yeah. Um, at this point, I still really, really love poker. So I remember after I sat down after this day, I had a long think and talk with myself pretty much. And I was like, all right, the decisions I make now are going to affect how poker goes. You know, I can either like cry about it and, you know, wish I got my, wish I could get my money back or I could actually just do it, you know? And like, I, I calculate, okay, I'm a three, four big blind winner, 200 NL. How many hands is it going to take? How fast can I play them? And I was like, all right, if I play 15 hours a day for three months, I'm going to be back to my 100k role so i was like you know what i've got nothing else to do like i love to play the game i'm just gonna fucking do it so i sat there and i, I woke up every day and I, and I did it you know and at the end i was back to exactly where i was and you know even though three months had gone and i hadn't made any money i would won a lot of buy-ins and i felt like okay i've achieved something here and i think this actually set me up very well for the rest of my career and even though it was a very difficult experience, I think it's probably one of the reasons why I had so much success over the years, because I developed this mental state of like, if you sit and do it, it gets done, you know? That must have been a very proud moment when you got yourself back to mm -hmm. zero. On one side, you could have looked at buy-ins and you would have been up infinite amount of buy-ins, but in terms of that dollar amount, it's like it took a while to kind of catch up to that 45K. So I'm guessing over the 10 years of your poker career, 14, if you from the start, you've had some years that were better than others. Do any years stand out for you? Um, my, my first year, or this year, this year, actually, it went very well. I didn't win so much money, but and quite a lot for me at the time and it felt very good because it was my first like over six figure year you know and then maybe a year or two later it went very very well I was still playing mid stakes but um I won a lot more than I thought I was going to and I had maybe a 100k live tournament score or something um and it was maybe double my previous best years um but then after that was maybe 2015 I would think but then after that it was just very 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 consistent and I started to move up slowly and play more 1K. And yeah, every year I just win a bit more than the last year. And it just kind of, the poker side started offering better and better rewards. Um, and it kind of just, yeah, never stopped. I couldn't, I couldn't stop because it was just, it was going very well. Mm. So for you, was the goal each year to beat last year's profits or to beat last year's volume or some sort of leveling up from the previous year? Um, no, actually not. I, I always wanted to stay on top. Um, I played, yeah, mid stakes always. And, you know, I always felt that I was the best player at the table, which was very good for me. This was another thing I didn't like when I was playing 5k. Like I knew there were guys at the table who were better than I was. Um, and, you know, I would play them sometimes. I used to slip up even from my very disciplined approach. Uh, sometimes I go and play 5k heads up against Katia, you know, and I know it's Katia and I know he's better than me, but like I'm down 5k from my session. So this takes one step, you know, um, and I would do that sometimes, but besides that, I had a lot of consistency and I just wanted to hit these volume targets. I always set volume targets. Like first it was supernova elite then diamond elite came out on party and I would just be like, okay, how much do I need to play each week, each month? And then I would do that. And I think that was always my targets. Yeah. What was it that attracted you to set regular volume goals? So I'm guessing when you start your career, there was a financial element and making the money was very life-changing. Mm -hmm. I'm sure like as the years are going by, hitting the same volume goals or similar from previous years has less of a financial change in your life. Yet every year you're showing up, still hitting volume goals. So what as your success kind of compounded over time, why do you think you are continuing to set yourself very high volume goals? Um, yeah, I guess when I first started playing, I, you know, I knew you could make a lot of money from poker, but I didn't really know how much, obviously. And then um, I was, once I found out about Supernova Elite and realized that it was actually possible that I could do it, like I really could. And I saw you got like 90K from Breakback or something. And I would play 2 million hands to do so. And even if you win at like, yeah, one BB, and at the time I was maybe a three or four B blind winner, even if you win at one BB over 2 million hands, you're going to have another 100K or something from the tables. 
So you can very easily make 200K a year and like doing something that you love without a boss. And like, this was the, the bottom of the table I thought for me personally. And so once I realized this, it was kind of like something clicked in my head and I was like, all right, if you do this for one year, it's 200K. If you do it for 10 years, you're gonna have 2 million bucks, you know? So it's just like, all right, let's do this for 10 years, whatever, and like see how it goes. And obviously after one year, I got banned on PokerStars. So kind of the plan had to take a turn, but then Party Poker started offering these deals. GG have even better deals, you know? And it's just like, yeah, I kind of realized if you if you sit there and you do this for 10 years, you will have enough money to not have to play or not have to work anymore. So like just do this for 10 years and the rest of your life can benefit. So. Yeah, so for you, you've got this very uh, long-term vision of where you want to be 10 years in the future, and then very much, a, um, I'd say like an obsession with the process of just hitting your volume goals. Obviously, you're enjoying the day-to-day -day grind. You're enjoying the lifestyle of being a poker player. You don't really think about much else outside of poker during these years because that's what you want to do. Uh, when did that start to change for you? I know recently you've taken a bit of a time, time out from poker. When did the grind start to feel a bit, a bit more of a burden to you or less enjoyable than it used to? Probably after maybe four or five years, I guess I, I guess I plateaued, you know, I got as good as I was going to be from the way I learned the game. Um, and then people naturally started to catch up. I remember when, when PyroSolver first came out, this was a pretty difficult time for me because I never used it. You know, I thought it was stupid, this program. Like, why do you want to learn how to play against a robot when you're playing against humans? You know, like everyone deviates every spot. So why does it matter? This robot, you know? Um, but then, of course, people started to become better and better. And then eventually I became not the best player at the table, maybe the second best, sometimes the third best, you know, without realizing. And it became pretty difficult. And I went on some very long break even stretches and stuff. Um, and it started to feel a bit more like work. Um, yeah, I, I don't really remember, of course, when the switch happened, but it definitely happened. You've mentioned a few times being the best at the table being important to you. Why mm -hmm. why does this matter to you? Um, I guess I always had this these thoughts of like, um, let's you're playing a six max game and there's one recreational at the table and like rate gets taken away and then this recreational gets his loss rate chopped up, basically. And the best player at the table, I always thought, gets the most of this. And if you're playing a table where there's other players better than you even with a recreational table, you can quite easily become a losing player at the table, depending on the recreational. And I always just liked knowing whenever I play a pot against someone, I'm going to be sharper. Like, it doesn't matter what cards come, you know, like I'm going to be sharper than they are. I'm going to know what to do. And then when I played higher games and I played against better players than me, it was uncomfortable. Um, I didn't like this feeling that no matter what I do in this pot, like, if I see that, if I check, it doesn't matter what size and I bet they are going to be outplaying me in this spot. I really didn't like that feeling. How did that feeling impact you? Did that make you step away from those games or did that get you curious about getting better and wanting to, to work on your game to, uh, to kind of come back stronger, so to speak? I would say it kept me away, actually. Um, I mean, it didn't, it didn't happen very often, but always for me like poker is, is purely just a mental game you know and when you're playing millions of hands it's just it's all mentality you know you need to have a good um baseline of course but it's all mental and if you're feeling uncomfortable in your sessions it's not going to go well you know like when i play 5k and you get put in a tough spot and you're like your head in your hands and like you just can't think and it's just difficult against someone better than you it's just horrible but when the same thing happens at 1k you know it's like it's only 1k best player in the world can put me in a spot I'm just going to call sometimes you know like who cares like whatever but when I'm playing 5k against uh like four Haley and these guys back in the day it was just it was terrifying and I just I just didn't like it and I couldn't focus on my other tables and just decided not to do it you know it just wasn't worth the maybe additional EV yeah yeah so it felt like these uncomfortable scenarios and tough opponents that, that you faced created this kind of internal feeling that one, hinder performance, but two, uh, you wanted to avoid feeling in the future. So mm -hmm. you would rather play mistakes at a higher volume and not play those games. Did you ever have the urge to uh, 
challenge yourself to play more against these, like to, to work through these problems. I'm just thinking from, uh, if you think about most things in life, when we experience it in a short sample, it hurts. So for you playing five Ks against like one of the best players, feeling a bit out of your depth, it's gonna sting, gonna hurt, gonna lose a lot of money. But you kind of know from your past experiences with 500s, 1Ks, that if you get enough repetition, build up a sample, have enough of a bankroll to take the swings, you could probably work through some of those things and maybe build your strategy. Did you ever have like moments of your career where you wanted to like reinvent your game and like attack the high stakes or were you very fixated on your current path? Um, I would say I was like hyper fixated on my current path, like I was, making more money than the high six guys anyway, you know, with my grind or some of them. And I was just very happy with how it was going. And I knew no matter what happened, how, how good or how bad I run, I'm always going to get to my number that I need after 10 years, you know, like, whereas if I play high stakes, maybe that doesn't happen. Maybe I have a few million more, but like, I don't need that or even want that, you know? So, and like, I've seen guys have top 1% runs, you know, at nosebleeds and stuff. And like, if you have a, one of these bottom 1% runs playing 5k or 10k or whatever, it's going to mean I have a break even year playing my 500 NL games. And it was, it, I think that would affect me so negatively that I would then start playing worse in my mid stakes games and maybe become a small loser. And again, just maybe spiral out of control. So I decided like maybe I played a few K hands of 5k every year, but like um, it wasn't really something. And, you know, all of my friends in poker, all of them went to play like high stakes, super nosebleeds, you know, Marcus Linus, Daryl, they all went on to become like actually the best players in the world in the, in the highest games. And, you know, maybe I lived through them when I talked to them about like how it's going and stuff. But like, I also saw what happened, you know, and I've seen, I see Marcus losing these 400k pots and watching hearing Linus lose, getting stacked for 500 big blinds, heads up at 40k. And it's just like, it wasn't for me, you know, to be honest. Mm. I didn't uh, yeah, I feel takes, uncomfortable. Yeah, I think it takes a lot of self-awareness and kind of discipline to uh, steer to your own path that you think's best for you. So as you mentioned, you've got a very challenging uh, um, kind of life you're living where everyone around you is moving up higher and higher and you decide to stay at mid stakes and play high volume one you don't like the kind of emotional turbulence that goes to the higher stakes but also you're a volume machine so you're one of those guys who can probably like out profit a lot of the guys in the games above just from your crazy volume at the stakes you play you feel very comfortable you enjoy the grind so it must have been very uh, i'm guessing challenging at times when everyone around you was moving up i'm guessing conversations were going down with your friends going hey come on frank time to time to join the 2ks 5ks what you're waiting for how were you, uh, one, resisting that, but also uh, staying confident in your own path? I think sometimes it's challenging when people around you uh, start to uh, kind of pressure you to do things. First of all, were you having pressure from your peer group? And how were you staying committed to uh, to your choices? I never really had so much pressure, you know, like I, I would play some high stakes MTTs with them, which I shouldn't have been doing because I had no idea how to play MTTs, but I have this cash game arrogance that you just can do it. Um, and, you know, over the years, a lot of guys have told me you should play some two K, play play two K, you know, on ACR, play two K, play three K, play play some f good five K games. But I guess when I had played these games, and I always had an amount of money that I was comfortable losing in my sessions, you know. And when it got above this this amount, I felt uncomfortable. And it just so happened for me that one K was just my level, you know. Like I'm very happy to call a guy down at one K. It doesn't matter. I'll get no stress if I lose or, or I won't even see sometimes, you know, if I lose, the table's gone. But when I'm playing 2K even or 3K, a lot more like emotion is going into these tables. And when I was playing 5K, maybe I win 15K in a session in like an hour. And I'm like, oh, nice 15K session. Don't need to play for the rest of the day. It can take two days off. And now my 1K and 500 volume and my Diamond Elite or my Supernova Elite all of this stuff is going to really suffer, you know? So if I win a lot, it suffers. And then if I lose a lot, it also suffers, you know? So when you're playing 5K, my, I always found my mid-stakes volume, which was 98% of my winnings for the year. This was going to suffer so much that it made it no worth to play the higher tables. Yeah, again, I think the self-awareness there is very high level to uh, understand that. There was an element of, in my mind, I was thinking, could you not approach 
the higher stakes in the similar way to mid stakes in terms of I'm going to play X amount of volume at 2Ks or X amount of volume at 5Ks and not really look at my results sample, just kind of blast out, um, obviously good game selection, a certain sample size. Did you never want to do that over the year? Of, as you said, the kind of turbulence you could experience doing that would have offset any of the potential upsides of that? Um, yeah, I definitely could have, but I, you know, I always saw poker in, in huge samples, you know, like when someone shows me a hundred K sample, like they don't even look at it, you know, like for me, like you play a million hands or whatever. Like when I, I came to GG to play and I was like, okay, I'm going fi to figure out how the game feels. I'm going to play a million hands here, see how it goes and then reevaluate, you know, whereas a lot of guys that don't have a million hands in their whole career, um, which is obviously fine. They just approach the game a different way. But mm -hmm. When I think, okay, maybe I can play some 5K, 3K, 2K in the year, it's going to be very hard for me to hit 100K hands, like very, very hard because the games don't run and when they do, there's one or two tables. So I just thought it's way too much turbulence, even over a year's period. And I don't have the mental strength to look at the five year period or even the one year period, you know, like I'm very focused on the day period. So yeah, it was just. It was just a bit too much for me. And I, I do think back of like, you know, if I'd spoken to a mental coach and fixed all this stuff, like, would I have made more money in my career? And maybe the answer is yes. Maybe the answer is no. Like, I'm not sure. Maybe I would have played less mid stakes. Like, who knows what would have happened? Um, mm -hmm. But I do have to think about it sometimes. Yeah, I think maybe the answer could be no as well. I think it's always interesting. Like, I'm kind of probing you here to like kind of play devil's advocate about like uh, what choices you made and could you play mm -hmm. higher. But in reality, like you made a lot of good decisions about what games you wanted to play. You maximize your output. You mentioned like two kind of career paths to make a lot of money in poker: play high stakes, uh, suppose sorry, high volume mid stakes, or play high stakes and obviously lower volume. For you, like as you mentioned, like the if you did play high stakes, the volume is always going to be an issue. You were never going to be able to hit super high volume at the game that were available there so uh, there was always going to be an element of yeah mental turbulence to deal with and for you you decided that was not going to be be the path which i think sometimes you've got to um almost like be happy with you made the choice and kind of don't worry too much about what was in through the other door if you had to talk mm -hmm. it could have went one way or the other so to speak um yeah i'm gonna hand over to Renny now i know Renny is very keen to uh, ask questions about how you evolved your strategy you've been around through many changes in the poker landscape so i'm sure Renny wants to dive in in terms of your evolution as a poker player could I just say one thing to finish that, please? Sure. Um, I think basically you just have to know yourself, you know, like you have to know, like, okay, I'm going to play 5K. At some point, I'm going to have a 200K downswing. How am I going to deal with this? Like, how is it going to affect me? And for me personally, I knew that that would make my life pretty miserable. Whereas for Daryl, you know, maybe it doesn't make it miserable at all. And like I said, I'm the only guy from my group that did this mid-stakes mega grind well and kind of Cameron couch as well um and at one point psec do you know this guy mm -hmm. um he was in the crossroads of like he was he's a very good player and he wasn't sure whether to go into the high stakes road or the mid stakes road and he asked me about it and like why i chose to do the mid stakes and stuff and we had a little talk about it and i just my advice to him was you know only you can make this decision you have to know yourself how is it going to affect you what do you want from poker and in the end, he's chosen to go into the high stakes route and it's probably the best decision and will make him the maximum EV. But it's a decision that only you can make. You have to know how the rest of your life is going to deal with these swings and stuff. And can you actually handle it? Actually, interesting that, 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 that you pointed it out, knowing yourself. I wrote down massive respect for you. The fact that you can... Say that, hey, listen, mid stakes is just or high stakes is not for me. I feel like it's something that Adam also touched on. There's a lot of peer pressure, or like, ah, you should move up, or at least that's how I have always experienced it. Like, I also experienced basically everything. Yeah, it's, obviously, it's uncomfortable, right? But then I figured there's something wrong with me. I should try to fix this. Uh, so I chose more of a different path. I was like, oh, I should try to fix all these problems. There's something wrong with me compared to maybe other players who don't really experience that. So I definitely wouldn't. I don't think I would have had or have had the same, I don't know, I guess. I don't really know how to lay with, but you just follow yourself. You do you. And yeah, no, no, kind of doesn't really matter what the rest says. So definitely a lot of respect 
uh, uh, respect for that. You also said like, yeah, why? Like if I have something guaranteed, yeah, there you could make more money, like more money. Yeah. Why? What, 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 what am I going to do with this more money? Right. It's like, yeah. there, there needs to be, there needs to be a deeper why at some point. I was, I was curious though, because you were talking about playing less, but in the same time, you're surrounded by poker players. I kind of felt like, let's say, let's say you're an alcoholic and you try to stop drinking. You live in a bar, you know, there's a problem there. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, there is a problem. But, uh, you know, I guess I always thought about it as being addicted to poker is very different to being addicted to alcohol. You know, like, it still has negative impacts in my life, but overall, it is still a good thing. No, oh, yeah, for sure. When I'm not playing, I still kind of, I get my fix, you know, through uh, being a bit B or talking to the guys and going to breakfast and just talking poker. And, you know, I, I lived poker for 10 years, you know, every single day just talking about the game all day every day playing the game and they still needed that element somehow even when i'm not playing it's, it's still nice to, to have it yeah you can now live it through others hi guys renee aka the wacko here with a quick mechanics of poker 2.0 announcement in our program you will get access to 80 plus hours of content in which we will explain you all aspects needed in order to become a more successful poker player now one of these of course is the technical aspect of the game in which I'll be explaining you all the mechanics behind poker strategies. We'll be talking about GTO, exploitive play with an extra focus on the why behind certain strategies and why the population has certain leaks. And to increase your win rate even further, we've recently added a river bluff and bluff catching section so you can increase your EV when those pots become very big. Our mindset and performance coach Adam Carmichael, he took care of the mental game and performance section of this program in which he will teach you everything you need to know in order to break through limiting beliefs, better handle your emotions, break free from tilt and play your A game more consistently. And last but not least, we've added the management and optimization section in the program in which we will give you various tips and tricks to make it more likely for your poker career to succeed and how to continuously improve as a poker player. Now on top of that, this concept is continuously evolving based on feedback and suggestions we get from our community. Next to all this content, you will have access to our exclusive Discord community, monthly live Q&A calls, and one-on-one -on -one coaching session in which we are going to be reviewing if you have been implementing the stuff that we teach you in the mechanics of poker correctly. So do you think you have what it takes to master the mechanics of poker? Go over to mechanicsofpoker.com and maybe you will get a chance to work with me and Adam and make more progress in your poker career. But for now, without further ado, let's get back into more goodness in today's episode. You actually mentioned uh, when Adam... And I mentioned reflecting on your year and which year was better, which year was maybe worse. You mentioned that at some point, I think it was after Solvers came out, that you found yourself in quite a long break-even stretch. I was wondering what you did in order to turn that around. Hmm. Um, I can't remember when the long break-even stretch was. I remember I had a, I had a million hands break-even um, with some rake back money at winnings but after the solvers came out and i started to struggle i remember actually what really helped me was you know my community and my friends you know like i i still have never downloaded pyro solver i use gto wizard which i, I think is really really good shout out to gto wizard i really shout like out, it shout out to the sponsor guy gto wizard <laughs> um and it's really been helpful for me because it's super basic and user friendly or whatever you know um but living with George and Marcus and being very close to and with Daryl and being very close to Linus and stuff and talking poker with these guys and you know George actually helping me with my game plan and some actual like like strategies was really what helped me get back to being one of the better players I think and just being surrounded by this all the time you know like I played quite a bit of heads up in my life like a few hundred k hands but like never studied but like I talked to Marcus or Linus for an hour every day at breakfast about heads up, you know, and like about hand histories. And for me, this was infinitely more valuable than 10 hours in Pyrosolvy, you know, like, mm. um, and of course, I'm very lucky, I guess, that I had, that my friends turned out to be the actual best players in the world. But 
Um, at the same time, you know, we always had this this poker crew of guys, and we were not selective with with who we invited. But when someone came and they were like in love with the game and super sharp and really interesting to talk to, of course, we become closer and they they join the crew. You know, we become better friends. So, yeah, it didn't just happen by luck. I think that we met these that we met each other. I remember uh, Elliot Rowe quoted it very nicely. He said. High stakes players don't hang out with each other because they're high stakes players. They're high stakes players because they hang out with each other. Yeah, it's very, right? very fast. I very, mean, very when fast. a lot of guys they started hanging out with each other, they were not yet the end bosses of high stakes, right? That was before that. And then because they started hanging out with each other, they became all the high stakes end bosses. Surprise, surprise. So I mean, yeah. maybe you could give a little bit of an insight. Any like big strategic breakthrough or aha moment you had at breakfast? Like, can you maybe share sh- share a little a little aha moment you had? Maybe maybe uh-huh. Daryl Linus. It sounds like it sounds like a good breakfast, man. If you if you ever go to breakfast, give me a call and if if I'd be over. It sounds sounds like a great breakfast. I'll pay, no problem. Um I, I guess I didn't really have any aha moments. You know, we were just talking about history for every day. And it, I really became a better player, you know, like understanding bet sizes and strategies and which boards I can range bet, which boards I need to have splits on and all of this stuff. Um, not over bluffing in certain lines or over bluffing in other lines and just really getting sharper and hearing their opinions and seeing that if it matched with mine that it would help me with confidence and stuff and just becoming a better a better player through this like um and i remember i used to play some guy heads up on party like a lot but i didn't really want to play him i just like wanted to have the lobby you know but because i got 12 tables on the side and then one day he's like messaging me on skype saying like yeah have you been studying recently you seem like better and i'm like nah i'm not studying but I just talk an hour every morning with Marcus and Linus about heads up. And he was he was just like, like, we're never playing anymore, you know. So it like it had the exact effect that I wanted. So yeah. It's funny, like how you don't really like I, I get it, right? You're just going to have breakfast. So it's not you're not going to have you're not going to study. But when he asked you, did you study? You say no, but I did have an hour talk okay. with Marcus and Linus at breakfast. So mm-hmm. but but you don't really see this as 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 studying, I guess. Yeah, because it's not like a forced study, you know, it's just like a conversation and you enjoy it and everyone's involved. And, you know, even though Marcus, Daryl and Linus are like infinitely better players than me, you know, like they don't talk down to me or or not listen to my opinion on hands or something, you know, And I, even though they play these high stakes games and I don't, we, I still feel like we're very, you know, equal as friends and stuff. It's like, it's very, very good and nice. And yeah, talking poker. I've done it for 15 years or whatever, just like never stopped. And it's just something I'm very, very used to. And I think it's very, very important for any young guy now, I would say like, you need to get a community. You need to get like absorbed into the game, have people that you can talk hands to for four hours every day for 10 years. And they're not going to get sick of it. You know, I mean, the guys get a bit sick of it, but like, yeah. I I do feel like that's a characteristic of, successful players that they realize that they can learn as much from you as the other way around. Okay. Maybe it's not exactly the same, but they can learn from, from anyone. I think it's uh, the people who wouldn't be open to advice from a guy who plays lower stakes are the guys who don't really play high stakes. I think it's Mm -hmm. definitely a, a characteristic. I actually spoke to George before this pod and he actually said that he thought that you were probably one of the best you have probably one of the best intuition of anyone he ever met for poker. What do you think are your strengths when it comes down to the technical ga- part of the game? Like obviously we talked about your consistency, your discipline, your high volume. When it comes down to executing like the technical game plan, what is it like? What What do you think is a, a big strength of yours? Um, I would say like yeah, the way I learned the game in like you know by feel kind of. Not like I'm Charlie Carell or something, but the way I learn it through like feel and seeing how people react and stuff. This after you do this for 10 million hands, it's very ingrained into your into your head, you know. And I think having a very strong baseline is super important. But then after after like all these years, you really know where or you feel or you know where people deviate from GTO, you know, where people are not bluffing enough where people are folding too much, where people's sizing is not indicative of their value range or, you know, all these like little nuances, you you just feel them because you've played so long and you know where humans play differently to the robots, you know, 
because no one, especially in mid stakes, no one's playing close to GTO. You know, like people will have, okay, maybe I know I have to bet the turn for 150% pot here as my single size, but no one is finding the exact frequencies or check raising the right percents or whatever. And so you know, okay, this guy is going to be check raising too tight or too wide, or this guy is going to be overbaying the turn too much and then giving up the river too much or not enough or like whatever. And everyone has these nuances or leaks in their game. And when you play so much with them, you get a feel for who's doing what, I suppose. For some of the listens, uh, listeners who don't have the ability to play 200, 300 hands every month to build this intuition, you know, a lot of uh, people nowadays study a lot of MDA. Is this like a, a way that they could kind of get the benefits of grinding that much without ac actually having to grind that much? Um, you know, I've only figured out, I only found out what this MDA stuff was a couple of years ago. I've never used any stats or anything while I've been playing. Um, but I actually, my personal opinion is that it's by far the worst way to play poker. Um, I think you don't learn how the game works at all. Mm. Sure, you know, if a guy's going to fold 60% here, I'm going to bet everything or whatever. But you never learn how the game works and you'll never be able to play against actually good players. And I actually played quite a bunch of Ignition at one point. And there, there's a lot of these guys. And, you know, they don't really know how poker works. They just know their numbers. And if you're someone that really understands the game, um, you can really, really do well against these guys and like really crush them because, yeah, it's just, it's not really fair. You know, they're better in their numbers and you're understanding every single spot and how blockers affect things and how, yeah, the game works. And I think if you want to do well in poker, you should really go down the road of trying to understand the game and like actually thinking through it. I actually think there is a, like the way I like to teach is more of a, I, I would say, I would say you would like, it's more of a hybrid approach because I'm also not a big fan of just like, listen guys, these are the numbers, you know, here you have a sheet, learn these numbers, execute, come on. I'm mm -hmm. more like, okay, we have a number, right? Let's say for example, MDA suggests an overfold or an underfold, an overbuff or underbluff. Then I like to say, why, why does this occur? Why is this number too high? Why is this number too low? Then yeah. you can look it up in the solver and say, what are like the heuristics of this spot that make it harder for a human to be closer to GTO, right? They deviate a lot. Why is that? And if you understand that why, mm -hmm. then you only need, you don't need to look at the sheet in all spots. You just learn a couple of heuristics of why people deviate, right? I think that's, uh, I think definitely MDA has a place because, for example, I actually heard you, you mentioned Charlie Carroll. Shout out to Charlie Carroll. Uh, you, uh, he also, he says, yeah, what does your intuition say? You should just follow what you, yeah, dude, but you've played, I don't know how many million hands, right? If you say, yeah. just follow your intuition, yeah, you have a strong intuition because you've played a million hands. But then they give this advice to someone who plays recreationally, maybe 10 hands a month. I'm like, yeah, he probably needs a different way of learning, right? And, of course, yeah. Uh, when, when it comes out to, to, to this MDA, I guess also the more nuances you start to add, so like the way they usually like the coach, right? Is just say, oh, you always call this spot. You never do this in this spot. They keep it simple because if you start to add nuances like texture, you need a bigger understanding and to have a deeper understanding, you know, you need to have a certain talent. So I think a nice thing about it uh, when you just explain stats and tell people to execute, I think some people who otherwise wouldn't have the potential to make money playing poker could now potentially play poker for a living. So I think that's... Uh, that's, That's for some people. So for some people, I think actually it's a benefit. But yeah, it's also not really in line with uh, with with my philosophy. You mentioned in ignition that you started to pick up on this. Hey, these guys are just you know good with numbers. They're following certain strategies based on data. You yeah. re recall any any good counters that you executed to these guys? You said, hey, uh, I, I I once I figured out that that I knew what they were doing. You know, I took them by the throat. Yeah, the, the thing is, like, I don't want to go too much into strategy, obviously, because I may still come back and play some poker, but most people know how to size for their value range, right? That's just like, value betting is easy. In poker, value betting is most people's bread and butter. They're just, everyone's good at it. It's just easy. Okay, but then at mid-stakes, most people, the way they think poker works is like, they don't try and be as accurate to GTO and be unbeatable. They try to beat other players and they try to exploit things and all of their bets have to have a purpose, you know, like, mm -hmm. okay, I'm going to bet 80% on this river. 
because I want the guy to call, but sometimes I'm going to bet 40% because I want him to fold for cheap, or I'm going to bet 110% because I want him to fold. You know, they're always, everything has a reason. Every bet has to have a reason. And then if you can figure out, you know, like what these reasons are, it means that you can really, really crush guys, you know, and some guys basically play with cards, but like face up, you know, mm. um, and quite often people will know they have a split on the river, you know, like they want to bet 75 and they want to bet all in or whatever. And then it's very easy to figure out which value hands want to go into which size. But then when people have bluffs, it's not so easy, you know, and people quite often slip up and um, find it a bit difficult in these spots, I think. Maybe some advice for the listeners listening. Hey, he's describing me. God damn it. He knows the cards that I have. How how, how do people fix this leak? Um, to fix, I guess, yeah. Maybe look at players who are, who you think are better than you. Study their games. Or, yeah, use GTO Wizard. Run some drills. Um, import your hands. And like, look at sessions, see where you've made like big mistakes or big deviations, you know, because like if you're making more than a few, like a three, four, five big blind mistake in a hand, something's gone wrong. And it's probably indicative of a strategy area, a error rather than just a hand error, you know. Um, yeah, because like playing around with sizing to achieve something can actually be very plus a V if you do mm -hmm. it because your opponent gave you a reason to do it. So he has a certain league. Let's say he just folds 60 regardless of the sizing you pick. Yeah, okay. Then I've got to size my value different than for my bluffs, right? But if you do it as a baseline strategy, right? As an overall approach, yeah, then then I can see that it's leaking. I, I, I think a good, good advice for the listeners is you have to think about poker or at least that's how I like to think about poker. You're telling a story, right? And the story that you're telling your opponent is I have a value hand. Right, you're always yeah. wrapping value, so you just always think, okay, what will my value do? What will my value do? And you just add bluffs accordingly. When you're the exactly. defender, you're trying to call bullshit on his story. You're like, what story is he telling? And then if you follow the story, then somebody's like, wait, if you're telling this story, then why is this bet sizing rolling out? This is not in line with the story you're telling, buddy. And mm -hmm. then usually it's indeed because they did something different because they wanted to achieve something uh, with their hand by using a bet sizing. So. As an exploit, because your opponent has a leak, sure. But as a general game plan, probably needs a little bit of an upgrade. Mm -hmm. Speaking about strategy, uh, I heard back in the day, you used to flat the small blind and then dunk shove any flop with a 7, 8, or 9 in it. Okay? Not something I see every day, I have to say, at the tables. But would love to hear your thoughts behind it. And I'll straight away follow it up with a question. Uh, what has been the most controversial strategies you've experimented with throughout your career and which ones were a big success and which ones did not stand the test of time? Okay, so let's, so let's, first... let's start with this dunk, shall we? Come on. <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay, so it's not exactly what happened, but this was when, like, before I knew about, like, 2 plus 2 or, like, anything to do with focus strategy and, like, how I was learning the game. Like, I, would, I learned that when people opened in four ring and people called in the small blind, they had pocket sevens, pocket eights, and pocket nines. This was this was the game. You know, maybe ace jack suited or whatever, but this is how it worked. And so I noticed this, and then I would play any time that there was a seven or an eight on an, or a nine on the flop, and I'd fly the small blind. I would check raise, where's the bet? Bet the turn, shove the river with my entire range. Like this was my strategy at the time. I didn't have any concepts of strategy. This was just like how I played poker. And, you know, it led to some hilarious hands where I'm check raising on ace, ace, seven, and then like betting the turn on a 10, shoving the river on a three with like queen nine suited and stuff and just like, just like hilarious stuff. But back then in those games, guys would fold ace king to you here, you know, because like all they've seen for years is people having pocket sevens in this spot. And like, you could see the guy tanking away on the river, you know, in these ridiculous spots and like, people would fold ace-king on ace-king eight to a check-raise bet shove, as they probably should have done back then, you know? But I guess I was the one guy who, like, took it to the complete other extreme and used it as my advantage and won, like, hundreds of buy-ins doing this, you know? And eventually a guy calls you down twice with top set. And so maybe you think, okay, I'm not going to do it against him anymore, you know? And I, Especially I, if you show queen nine. Yeah, that, 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 that is a problem. Queen nine is probably exactly. a bit uh, out of So did you then also, for example, I like... 
this is what I like about poker, right? And in Solver World, it doesn't work like that because Solver World knows the strategy, knows the cards. But in the real world, guys, there is only a perceived range. And if you know how your range is perceived, you can start to move hands in that range that might not hit your actual range, but they hit your perceived range. So when you don't have it, you have it. And when you have it, you don't have it. If you, if you yeah. still, if the listener is still following with it. So did you then also, for example, I, I, for example, I would always prefer to have five, six suited over pocket sixes because with five, six suited, I could wrap the set. And with sixes, I would actually have the set and having the set is less fun than hitting a five or a six with your five, six suited and wrapping the set. Yeah, but it took me a few years to realize this, you know, like I, I genuinely just didn't know. I was just used, people would fold this spot, I would check raise my entire range by the time I shoved the river. Like, why not? Like, what are they going to do about it, you know? I just didn't really understand. And then as I got better, of course, and started playing higher stakes, I would learn a bit more about strategy. And I remember like the first time someone's told me that when there's three hearts on the board and you have the ace of hearts, you can bluff because they can't have the nut flush, you know, like this was mind blowing, you know, and obviously I took it to the maximum, maximum extreme. And um, I would, if, if someone check raised me and there's three hearts on the board on the river and I have the ace of hearts, I would put like my entire bankroll in there, you know, just like never stop betting. And eventually Steve told me, or like he taught me like, yeah, when people are repping a really strong range, you don't have to try and win the pot against them, you know, try and, try and win against their their weak range rather than their strong range. Don't wow, this, this is this, against for, check raises. For the audience, this thing I would like to highlight the point that Steve just pointed out to uh to Frank here. This is this can make you a lot of money. Try to avoid yeah. the strong ranges and try to attack on the weak ranges. This is this is this is some money makers guys. <laughs> yeah. And like you know, like these things of course they sound super obvious, but before solvers, before any poker strategy, they were kind of light bulb moments, you know. Um, I think especially yeah. for you, like, because I think that's definitely a skill of yours listening, listening to your story. You just took a concept and just put a confidence behind it and max executed, right? Gathered a lot of, gathered a lot of feedback. And then I think you were probably with this concept, you were definitely ahead of the curve all the time. And then when people would start to catch up, like you said, you already won a hundred buy-ins doing this. And that's yeah. when the rest started to catch up. Uh, where did this confidence come from for example i would say i was always less confident let's say i would hear something i would start to slowly I implement it but i would need feedback hey it worked okay next time i'll do try to do it a bit more often a bit more often where did that confidence come from that you straight away would go all in such so like hey that's cool because i had some friends who i would for example do strategy with and then he uh, I, one guy in particular i remember he would then say I wasn't doing so well. He was doing very well. And he said, yeah, I don't know. I just do exactly what you tell me to do. Uh, but the difference is he would actually consistently do what I said that I, that I thought was right. But I would always still doubt myself and I wouldn't fully execute on what I actually believe was right. So where did that uh, confidence come from? Um, yeah, I guess it was maybe a bit of a blind self-confidence. Um, my results were always very good. So I took confidence in that. Um, I had a good reputation. and in the games that I played, like once I started posting on two plus two, you know, everyone was maybe not looking up to me because they had all been around for longer, but they had a lot of respect from these guys, which helped, even though I was playing very different strategies and making posts about like ridiculous hands, but like my thoughts were kind of going in the right direction, but I was just like messing up or being way too wide, but like really thinking about the game in like a deep level from like quite early on. And then, yeah, I never, no one ever taught me how to play the game, I guess. Like if someone finds poker now, they download GDO Wizard, right? Straight away. And they have this tool that tells them like how to play. So you never really figure out the game yourself. You never figure out how it actually works and like where you're making the money maybe. Right. Whereas if you started playing like a long time ago, you have these advantages, I think. Yeah, what, the, what are kind of the advantages that you think old school players who had to figure out the game before solvers have over the new school players who would now enter the game and just learn it through solvers what are like some advantages that comes up us old school players have over the new school players and where do new school players miss kind of that old school knowledge yeah i think the old school guys they well basically with solvers people that have learned studying solvers this is all they've ever done they're always going to be inaccurate. Like their human tendencies are always going to take over. Like even the best, best players who are studying solvers all the time, 
will still make deviations, you know, without intending to. And I think the best old school players that also have a very good fundamental of GTO will feel or see or notice where they are deviating. Whereas the, the GDO guy, he doesn't even notice that he's deviating. Mm. I can, I can tell you, I can tell you one hand actually, um, that I played that was, I, I felt was a good example of this. Um, we're 150 big blinds deep, um, small blind button three at pot. I three about ace queen, the guy calls. Uh, flop is ace king three, rainbow. Um, I see about the guy raises, I call. Turn is a queen, um, bring a flush draw. We check the guy that's 40% pot, he calls. Uh, sorry, we call. And then the river is a 10. So any jack is a straight. Uh, so the river is a jack in this hand. So any 10 is a straight and it's like half pot left. Uh, we check and the guy shoves and we call. And I looked at this hand in the solver and the guy in this hand had pocket twos, which is like a super, super approved line. Um, if you raise the flop, it just puts this whole stack in. But the problem about this hand was that the, the solver is still shoving pocket threes for value. And the solver is raising like some random 10x stuff, like some on the flop. And I think people that have studied this hand, you know, you see quite early on that you can raise pocket twos and pocket fours here. But then you maybe miss some of the other raises that now make straights on the river. And you miss this pocket threes value shove because you're a human and you're scared of four straight, whereas the bot is is different, you know? Um, and people in, can just miss this kind of stuff because they're not playing the spot perfectly. Like mm. if you're against an actual robot, your ace queen is very indifferent here because it plays flop completely correctly and river correctly. Whereas against a human, maybe they misplay the flop slightly. Maybe they misplay the river and all of these things like add up pretty quickly to being able to exploit people in for quite large margins, I would say, just as an example. That is a very good example. And this is like where the experience comes in, right? Because how the equities run on the river in this spot in practice is actually different. It's it's, it's maybe even right to to check back pocket threes there. Mm -hmm. uh, especially I would imagine, for example, the big blind or the out of position player might need to generate a dunking range on the 10, uh, which people don't do. So I would say that that checking back the, the threes there is probably good. So, but you mm -hmm. realize that and that there's like some heavily polarization going on compared to Solverland, and therefore you you make a hero call. So therefore we should probably shove still shove pocket threes. But then again, you you you've adjusted to uh to how you think your opponent thinks, and that's probably I would say a skill that you possess after playing having played more than 20 million hands more than mm -hmm. any other player. You probably have the best view for how does my opponent think on what my on what level does my opponent think and uh yeah how can i think one level ahead because that's exactly what you were describing right when you were wrapping this thing well my opponent thinks i have a set so how can i be one, one step ahead so i definitely think that's been a, a very valuable skill in terms of the because we didn't really touch on it in terms of some controversial strategies you've experimented with through throughout your career any anyone stick out controversial strategies um, yeah, I'm sure you've tried a lot of shit. There was a guy a uh, very long time ago, like again, when no one knew how to play poker, he had a very good strategy that I liked where he would flat the small blind or the big blind, and then he would lead the flop. Every single flop he would lead for like one chip or 1.5 big blinds, every single board, no matter what. And then if the guy raised him, he would just fold like 90%, 95% of his range. But if the guy called, he would then over the turn, shove the river and do like complete madness. So like his thoughts were like, you cap the guy's range because he doesn't raise you, which you would always do with his value hands. Mm. Um, and this guy, he won like hundreds of thousands of dollars playing this strategy because like, I don't know, when you're playing so much volume, people don't notice what's happening or something. And I used this occasionally. Like I thought it was quite interesting. I was never... And of course, this doesn't work anymore because people know how to play. Um, so I thought that was always very interesting. And I like I like donking in general, like donk showing the river. I really like. I think it's probably the most underbluffed node in poker history. But I think it's very a very useful tool to have that not many people will find. I think it's very good. No, oh, yeah, donking river usually gets triggered by 
by your hands. And guess what? They have value and they don't want you to check behind. So yeah, that's how you get out of bluff note right there. Basically, the sure. trigger, the, the 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 trigger is the the trigger is the value hand. Basically, actually, what, what you're describing is guys, Phil, Phil Helmut was right, man. You just put out a little bet to see where you're at. The guy just calls. Now you know where you're at, and then you just up the pressure. I don't, I don't mm -hmm. know if Hamut would have followed it up with an overbet jam river, but uh, I, I, I like it. I think it's still somewhat true in like some spots where you donk. If you look at the amount of, I, th I think it's easy to raise too much versus for, versus the donk, especially with values. I would say in practice, if you would node lock some some boards where we donk and they call, uh, I would mm -hmm. say it's. Pretty, pretty approved to 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 start firing some big bets on uh, on later streets as well. Something for the audience to experiment with. No money back guaranteed. Throughout the pod, you mentioned Steve a lot. Steve gave you a lot of good advice in poker. What has been the worst advice you have ever been given, or do you think that's given in the poker community often? Hmm. The worst advice. Hmm. I think I, I would say the worst advice that people say is to is to try and go down too much of a GDO um, road and like, you know, defend every spot perfectly and hit. Like there, there's some spots in poker where, where guys, don't, guys don't fold, you know, or like, or guys only fold. So like, don't try and play too much like a, like a robot, you know, try and actually, if you play mid stakes, exploit people you know, in, in small ways, just deviate a little bit or whatever. Maybe if you're one of the best in the world and you're playing super high stakes games against the best players in the world, then it's better to try and play as close to GTO as you can. But um, I would say the best, like the worst advice would be to like not freestyle at all, you know, like just to play within your strict rules and never deviate, I think is very bad to do. You mentioned that you know when you play high volume, you need to simplify some of your strategies, right? When you play a lot of tables, you said range bet where you can range bet, but you now also advocate a little bit more flexibility. Where does flexibility enter into your strategy, right? You have like some general baseline rules, but do you how much flexibility do you allow yourself? It's like, oh, this is a range bet, but this specific hand, I might want to use a different sizing or I want to might check. How much flexibility do you allow while playing that much tables? um normally it comes in on the river honestly like i'll play the flop and turn pretty much the same it's all of my opponents and then on the river i will have some some thoughts sometimes on the turn but on the flop basically i just play everyone the same if the guys are mega knit or the guys like super aggro maybe like make some slight deviations but like not really you know so basically you, because also the amount of tables you play, you're trying to get to the river, wasting as much brain power as possible, right? To try to send it as much possible. And then yeah. on the river, I guess you put yourself in a strong suit where you've played these lines over and over again. Mm -hmm. And you know, okay, this is a classic over blast of this classic on and you adjust accordingly. Um, Pretty much, yeah. And I will, I will try and think of like what hands in GTO or how, how much we bet and which hands are like the highest frequency bets and stuff. And like, I'll set my sizing and then decide if I'm going to give up or bluff or whatever. And then maybe take the player type into account a little bit, you know, uh, but never too much. Like it's always pretty solid. I think. You mentioned that uh, you're, you also like to, uh, you're active in your community. You, you mentioned BitB as well, the BitB community. What is the common discussion you get into when talking poker or discussing a hand with uh, with some people? Shout out to Bit B guys. Okay, shout we, out to we, Bit B. we could also give Bit B a little shout out here. Bit B yeah. Cash. Bit B, a great bunch of lads, mate. Like it was started by uh, by Donald, my like original housemate, very very smart poker player, and then obviously George and took over, and they've got Daryl in there coaching Cameron. You know the probably biggest one K winner of all time. They got PSEC, all the other coaches are like real sickos. And some of their students have actually turned into like actual sickos. Um, very, very impressive stuff. You know, like I'm not involved in it, but I live in the house and I see the success stories and I've met some of the students. And I I was never someone that advocated for giving away your profits. Like mm -hmm. I always thought you can do it by yourself. But like, if you want to join a CFP, like I don't even know if they're taking guys, but like 
they're very very good and I would do it myself personally if I wasn't at the end of my career so yeah so so you, you mentioned you're you're not actively yourself within the within the CFP but I assume you've sometimes talk to students any like common discussion points that come up when you discuss hands or you don't really mingle with uh in the, in the strategy talk there um not in in the server i'm not really involved but like when they make some trips like some holidays like it's, they've got a real good community um i join on the holidays and stuff and just talk to the guys and you know they like to hear my stories or something i feel i can't really talk about strategy because of the other coaches who are there, you know, just like much better players than me. Um, but I always like to talk to them and share experiences and just like, you know, talk like we're just, we're just normal guys. So, Like you've played such a long time. I was wondering what is like a long-standing mistake or approach that you found challenging to let go of, or maybe something that you have a hard time admitting in your strategy that you're doing wrong, but you just cannot help yourself. Um. Yeah, because of how many tables I've always played, I've always thought that I'm really paying attention, even in small pots. But, you know, I have noticed over the years that this is not really the case. And you kind of do win all your money in the like 10 big blind pots or whatever it is. Um, and I've never studied, even in GDO Wizard, like a hand smaller than 50 big blinds or something, you know, like I've just never, I had so many big pots to study. I never really looked at the small ones. And um, I was speaking to a high six player the other day, like a new guy, very, very good, very, very sharp. Um, and the pot was like, it was check, check, flop, check, check, turn. And then we bet third pot on the river, you know, just like a pot you play 500 times a session. And I've never really thought about this. It's just like, do whatever you want, you know? And I was sitting with him and he studied, studied it with me for... 30 minutes you know we played both sides of it looked at the exact blockers and everything every frequency like what's our turn strategy in this in this spot what's our river split how do we play and then as the imposition player you know like when we've checked back the turn here how does our side card affect the how we're going to call the river like do we want to have the turn flush draw or do we not like when he's gonna bet the turn flush draw it means that when he checks the turn, when he bets the river, you don't want to have these cards or like, you know, it's just my head was spinning upside down. And you're like, and oh my thinking, God, the pot got checked through. There's only there's <laughs> only five big blinds and it never looked at this in my life. Exactly. And then, you know, I kind of had this realization that the high six guys are the true sickos, you know, they're doing this for every spot, you know, and they're really just, they're going to beat you in every spot. So um, this is something I'd never done in my game. And I guess if I was going to start again, I would try and get better in these small pots and really be a bit sharper, you know. I think it's just a natural mid-stakes league because as, as you said, mid-stakes, you make the lack of money up with volume, right? A lot of players just on average will play more tables. So it's the smaller pots that people less care about. So if you decide to care about the small pots and your opponents don't care about the small pots, a lot of small pots make a lot of big, add, add up to a lot of big pots. Yeah, definitely. And like most people know how to play 400 big blinds in like a three bet pot, you know, like they know they can bet bet show pocket kings or whatever, or they know they have to call down pocket tens on this low board most of the time or whatever, you know, but in these like 20 big blind or like check, check turn and then check raise river or over bet probe or third pot, like all this stuff is where people really have no idea, you know, like everyone just freestyles it. And I think no one's ever like, or I'm sure some people study it, but like, most people, I feel this is the biggest leaks or biggest, the worst parts of their game. Adam, anything uh, that's on your mind? I'm reading the whiteboard behind and it says, there's beauty in the struggle. What does that mean to you? Um, I guess that's got something to do with like overcoming down swings. And, um, you know, when you play um, really high volume, you're going to have a lot of down swings and things are going to go badly for much longer than you ever thought. But then when you finally come out of the other side, you get this really nice feeling of like, you know, it's nice to overcome the difficulties. And I think it's actually, instead of winning 20K every month, you know, consistently, it's nice to sometimes lose for a while and then 
come back out the other side and see the light, you know, it's a, it's a good feeling. So what are some of the things you do during a downswing to uh, learn to embrace the struggle a bit or enjoy the struggle? Um, just play more, I guess. Just never, never stop, mate. Like, if you know your downswing is going to be 300k hands, you know, better to get it out in a month rather than, or two months now, rather than six or seven months, you know. Just, um, and also, I guess in the big downswings, I would try and actively look at my own numbers maybe my stats and study a bit more and see where things were going wrong if i'm actually just running bad or like if there's a bigger problem any anything you notice when you go through your stats in a downswing compared to when you're not in a downswing um well firstly i'd say i only ever go through them in downswings um <laughs> but there's <laughs> there's always something to to see something that's going wrong you know um and often when you when you start playing when I play more tables, you lose a few percent here, you know, you're calling the turn, under calling the turn by five percent, or over blocking the river by five percent, or or whatever it is. These things like you check fold in the flop, ten percent too much, or five percent, and like these things they really creep in quickly. Mm. Um yeah, so it's good always good to find them out, I think. Yeah, so I think for you, uh, in terms of the in seeing the beat in the struggle, there's one element of remind yourself that it's just a short-term thing. I had to play through it. For you, volume's not been a problem. So you just turn to your strengths and kind of grind through that. But also I think it links in as well with what you said earlier about doing hard things and embracing challenge. And I do feel like for most of us doing hard things or going through hard times is how we build resilience, how we build mm -hmm. like strength of character in ourselves. And also like uh, there's an element of kind of self-worth in going through hard times and coming up to the side of it where you can look back and go, I'm glad I went through that because I'm a better person for that i know you mentioned that kind of experience of losing a lot of your role and then rebuilding it you had that kind of um experience where you felt proud of but building it back and i do think the remind ourselves sometimes when we're going through a downswing a tough time that is temporary and that we're building resilience of character to come through this are, are two things to remember because i think every single player listening to this will be uh, at some point going through a quite large downswing and questioning their life choices and trying to uh, hope it'll end soon so yeah i think it sounds like you've got a good good system there so i want to do a bit of reflecting on your career for a long and successful one what would you say is the biggest contributor to your success and you can't answer with volume um 100 the community and my my friends that i've had around me the whole way like i really believe i couldn't have done it without them if i hadn't met steve i don't know where my career would have gone i'm sure it would have gone okay but like maybe i wouldn't have gone on to meet daryl and then become friends with all the vienna guys and met george and stuff but you know, throughout all the difficult times, my friends have always really been there for me. Um, and not just in poker, you know, in life in general. Like, I feel very, very lucky to have met all of these guys that will be friends for a lifetime. And when poker's going badly, they, you can just bounce ideas off them. And, you know, if you've, if you've lost 20 buy-ins and then your roommate can come down who's a better player than you and he'll sit with you and look through the hands and say, yeah, I would have lost them too. You know, it's very helpful for confidence and and stuff and just living the game and like being surrounded by it for so long with so many good players is by far the, the reason I've had the most success, I would say. Yeah, great answer. Yeah, it's hard to quantify the kind of the impact of the people around you, especially the immersive experience you've lived. It's hard to almost imagine where you would be without that kind of community and peer group around you. So yeah, it's really, uh, it's all those things again, it comes up a lot on a podcast, like the community you have around you. Uh, but yeah, it takes time, as you mentioned earlier, that like kind of that obsession for poker, you find other people who are obsessed with it, who think clearly have smart brains and you guys create a bit of a super team over time because you uh, have the same passion and drive. And then over time that is, becomes its own thing that kind of drives more and more success. So next question is, what would you say is one thing that poker has taught you that you didn't expect starting out in your career? Hmm, that I didn't expect. I guess it has taught me, you know, that you really can achieve anything that you want. Um, when I, Before I found poker, you know, I always thought, yeah, you can get a job and be successful or whatever, maybe. But then with poker, you know, like it, it definitely taught me that if you work hard, you can be successful. You will be successful. It's only you. And like 
you can do really hard stuff if you want you know like if you want to sit and play for 10 hours a day or study for five hours a day and play for a few hours a day every day for a year you can do it you know like you, you really can do it nothing's stopping you except for you and then this spills out into other things in life you know like if you think something is very hard and too difficult for you there's no reason that it should be you know like you can do it if you put your mind to it and I guess achieving these like super high volume targets and things I never thought I could do has helped me in other ways in life and like like now when I set this super hard fitness challenge or I want to learn German or something like this you know I don't have something in my brain telling me like you can't do it now I have something telling me you can do it you know if anyone in the world can do it you can do it you know like why shouldn't you and I think poker definitely helped me develop in this way what a powerful mindset yes yeah, so I was getting two things there one was that power to do hard things so I can do hard things and challenge myself to do them and the second is hard work pays off if I put mm -hmm. hard work in to something I get a good outcome and I always like look at when people say uh, like oh wow look how good this guy is at this thing and it's always like yes correct he is but it's like how much work went into that like you're judging yeah. like the outcome of 10 years of practice hard work dedication and the rest and then you judge like wow he's so good at this when I was like wow that guy was dedicated to his craft to uh to get to that level of mastery so yeah I think it's a just you need one one thing in your life where you push yourself hard and you have success to uh, kind of realize you're capable of more than you think one of the things i feel a little bit sad about with my coaching with players and just having conversations with players who struggle is some players almost like don't believe that they're capable of doing hard things like this thing of like they uh, they almost don't want to go all in in case they fail and they almost believe that they're, they're not capable of achieving what they want to in life so for you like how did you uh, start to build this confidence in yourself that you could work hard and have success because there'll be other players in your situation who might not go all in with poker they might be wanting to play high volume but like what was if I fail and I don't have the success I want? All of this lingering voice in the mind going, maybe I'm not smart enough, maybe it won't work out for me. So for you, early days in particular, what were you doing to uh, build a mindset that allowed you to prove to yourself you could do hard things and have success at the end of it? Yeah, I, I guess, you know, I never started with this mindset. It kind of developed or evolved from doing these hard things and seeing like the results and the success. I never started with this attitude. It just kind of came. And I guess when I was younger and I thought I definitely did think you know like what if I fail what if it goes wrong what if I'm not as smart as I thought I was what if these poker players are better than me but then there's like there's this like quote that pads is always using where it's like you know what if I fail and then on the other hand like yeah but what if you don't you know what if you succeed what if you fly you know just like and when you're young if you have two or three years where it goes badly and you lose some money you know you can always start again it's not the end of the world it's much tougher if you're finding poker now at 40 years old and you have a family, then I wouldn't really recommend it. But just just try it, you know, just see what happens. And yeah. Mm -hmm. As you're getting towards the end of your high volume grinding career, or at least at this stage, you're taking a little bit of a, a break to re recoup. Who knows if you'll be back to the full-time ways in the short-term future. What are some of the things you've reflected on in this time that's going to break away from poker? And what are some of the things you feel like if you went back into poker or you had to start from scratch for whatever reason, you would do differently this time? Um, I've been like definitely reflecting on how, because you know, when you have this huge dopamine thing from poker for hours a day, like the adrenaline and it's like, you're almost like wired, you know, like, like you've been taking drugs or something. This spills out into the rest of life for sure. Like you, you'll go somewhere and have breakfast with someone or meet someone in the evening and you're still kind of in this poker world and you're like, your head's a bit shaky and you're just not really quite there. And I noticed that just in my day when I'm like, I'd be getting very annoyed about things or trying to have breakfast and I, I just, I can't do it without having Twitch on my phone or like some kind of input, you know? And now since I've stopped playing poker, I'm feeling much calmer, less um, annoyed about things. And I was, I was worried for a while, like if this approach to poker will have lasting health impacts on me or like has really changed my brain psych physiology or whatever, but it seems like things are going better um and so if i was to ever come back the one thing i really really important more important to me than winning money is to you know play my two-hour session and stop um and that is like by far the most important thing for if i come back to play 
Mm. How would you implement that? Because like you mentioned George sending you a timer of three hours and you throw on the phone across the room. Yeah, so how would timer. you implement that two hour rule? Uh, I, I had this tilt breaker app thing before and like it closes my tables after two hours, you know, and I'm like uninstalling the program in one second and like starting another session and playing for 10 hours. And yeah, the alarm thing doesn't work what I'm really trying to do is like set this, these fitness disciplines and just hope that they are more powerful. And like my timer goes off and I'm like, okay, well I have to eat now and I've got to work up later. So I want to do this more than I want to play poker. And let's hope that that works. We'll see. How do you feel when you're not active, either playing poker, doing an exercise challenge, when you're just sat you in a room with your thoughts, how does that unfold for you? Yeah, well, this is something we talk about in therapy a lot. And firstly, it's something I didn't do for 10 years, maybe. Um, I didn't have downtime. It just like wasn't a thing. If I wasn't playing poker, I was playing video games or doing some kind of workout or trying to improve in some skill. Like I didn't have downtime. I didn't really understand this concept, I guess. I thought like, yeah, if you were having downtime, someone else is going to be working, you know, like and I guess we have this really ingrained into our culture, especially in like young men in these like online fields is that you have to be working all the time. Um, and I had these thoughts and when, when I saw people were playing 20K hands a month and chilling the whole day, I would kind of feel like, what are you doing? You know, you're wasting your time. But now that I'm older, I see that this stuff is very important in life and maybe, I mean, definitely more important than playing poker. And I just... I see it a bit differently. Um, but yeah, before, if I tried to sit for five minutes, I remember when I was first going to yoga, I do a lot of yoga now. Um, the yoga classes were fine because you're moving your body around. But then at the end, we would lay on the ground and do like three minutes of meditation maybe. And then in one class at the end, the woman was like, okay, we're going to do a 15 minute meditation now. And I was like, fuck me mate these three minutes are almost like death for me already like what am I gonna do and like after like 12 minutes my whole brain is like shaking in my head I'm like having all these thoughts of like man can someone pull the fire alarm or like can I just run out of the class or like how am I gonna get out of here I, like I literally couldn't physically stay there anymore it was too difficult for me um but now like a year or two later with meditations and more yoga and stuff I can lay on the floor for 30 minutes and just my mind is I have thoughts but I'm much calmer and it's, it's much better. Yeah. Yeah. Super interesting. And yeah, I really love that you've been able to uh, make progress with this as well. Go from uh, almost like three minutes being too much to now being to do half an hour stints. And mm -hmm. as you mentioned, you've almost like trained yourself to be fully stimulated all the time and always active. So then when yeah. the mind's not stimulated, one thoughts come up that you've been suppressing for long times, but also like the mind goes into panic mode. Like, what is this? Where's the stimulation? Well, what's going on? And it almost creates a little bit of a, almost like a stress response in the body as well. Like that what, I've got no stimulus. I need to get something or it goes the opposite way into complete boredom. I'm not sure if you experienced that as well, where it goes almost as this disconnection where you feel low energy. Um, so yeah, for you, it feels like the almost like a bit undoing a little bit of the over addiction personalities traits and the approach to poker. But it's funny because you look at a lot of players who will have played mid stakes alongside you and they'll idolize your volume and they'll be like, wow, Frank played so much volume. I'm a I'm so lazy. I can't, yeah, I can't bring myself to play that much, but there's always like, there's always a seesaw, like a kind of back and forth of like, what's a healthy amount, what's a good amount for the situation, and when do you push it too far? So I think for you, obviously, you've had a lot of success with your approach, and there's not saying it wasn't the optimal approach, but also there's been some trade-offs in terms of like life balance and kind of your state of mind or peace of mind when you're not able to play, which you're kind of working on correcting now. So uh, for you, like in terms of things you're doing on a daily basis, you mentioned yoga, you mentioned uh, some meditation practices. What are some of the things you're doing alongside your fitness at the moment to uh, create a bit of balance? And what do you enjoy doing when you're not active with the challenge or playing poker? Um, yeah, I really enjoy my fitness stuff. I like a lot that, you know, if you do a workout and you eat, your, eat the right food, your body will get stronger. That's just how it goes. In poker, a big problem for me always was like, yeah, you can study and yeah, you can show up every day and play, but sometimes for two months, you're going to have less money than you started with. Like, that's just a way it's just going to happen. Whereas with the gym, you know, or like running, if you go running, the next time you are going to be faster if you do your recovery and like, it's just directly what you put in, you get out. 
so I really enjoy that. Um, I I'm enjoy I'm actually enjoying like learning German at the moment. I'm putting quite some time into that, and it's very nice to see yourself finally get better after some years. Um, I quit playing League of Legends, which was a very big part. I wouldn't even say I enjoyed it by the end. It was just what I was doing with my time because like I was really playing, trying to get to a high level or something. Um, I wouldn't say I was enjoying it, but that was kind of my thing that I was doing that wasn't poker for a long time. But I always somehow need to have some kind of thing that I'm either improving or, or like learning or something. I'm not very capable at the moment of just relaxing or doing things purely for pleasure. And that's always been a big problem for mine, but it's something that I'm addressing and hopefully improving on. Mm. You seem to like linear progress towards a goal or an outcome. What is it about that, that pro progression that you can see with your actions or your results? What, what does that do for you? Why, why is that an important part of your, your life? Yeah, I'm actually not sure what it is, but I used to remember, like I have always enjoyed playing poker, but I had, I always set these huge volume goals, you know, to do Supernova Elite or Diamond Elite. And then I'm grinding the whole year, like not miserable, but not particularly happy thinking that when I hit this final goal and I get my 20K bonus or I hit my million points or whatever it is, I'm going to feel this huge rush or achievement or something really, really good, you know, and then I would grind for the whole year and I would finally get there. And like you, you hit the millionth point and you get the little splash on the computer and then, you know, every single time I just feel nothing, you know, like, I, like, like genuinely, like not even like slightly happy. It's just like, all right, another hand or whatever. And then I started to learn that, you know, it's, it is all about as cliche as it sounds. It's all about the journey, not the destination, you know, and like, if you're not enjoying the actual process, you're not going to enjoy, you're not going to get this magical thing when you get there, you know, and um, yeah, I guess I always found this a little bit hard. Um, yeah I can relate to this as well like I've got probably uh, growth as one of my highest values and I did super of elites for three years in a row and I had some years where I was playing slightly too low to kind of achieve that with normal volume I wasn't quite matching your kind of hours I remember one year where I had to play 88 out of the last 90 days of the year and 10 hours a day and I remember taking a half day for um, it was actually sports personality of the year it was in, was in my hometown and then I had half day for Christmas and I remember going to half days over like two days of the year and I remember like just hating poker during that time hating the, the grinds and I remember finishing exactly as you mentioned got the kind of super overlay bonus expecting this to be like a monumental day yeah. and I was just like oh thank god for that close the browser down I'm not touching poker for a week and I remember just thinking wow like I spent I, I spent my whole year for that milestone and then the, the finish line towards that and the end point was just like such a demoralizing experience I was like why did I set that challenge for? See, I think sometimes we've got to like kind of align our kind of goals with some, like, as you mentioned, the, the progress and the kind of the journey is more important than the destination. But sometimes the, the journey is tough, as you mentioned, like kind of the beauty and the struggle as well. Yeah. Sometimes we've got to acknowledge that every day is not going to be like all bright lights and kind of roses. We're going to have some uh, tough moments, but also like trying to find like that kind of balance where I enjoy my day to day. I don't need the end outcome, so to speak. Like, yes, it's a good thing to aim for, but I'm going to enjoy the progression of getting better. I feel like for myself, and it feels like you're, you as well well on that journey of trying to uh, find kind of goals that I set myself that the journey itself is all I need if I don't achieve the goal I don't care I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm making progress towards it um, and I'm going to try my best to achieve uh, get to a certain outcome but if I don't I'll have, I enjoy the journey itself so uh, yeah I think for you it, obviously the challenge continues to uh, try to find that kind of sweet spot where you're not kind of driven by addiction and impulse and you're enjoying the pursuit so um, for you as you uh, potentially get back into poker or take on new pursuits in the future what are some of the things you would like to uh, do differently? You mentioned like this kind of two hour rule of, of volume. How do you kind of create that balance for yourself where you're able to uh, enjoy the process and the journey and not get sucked into uh, your addictive tendencies? Mm, yeah, well, we're gonna have to see how that goes. I would, I hope moving forward, I could, to be honest, be a, like a bit less selfish, you know, like throughout this 14 years, I was very, always very selfish on reflection and putting myself and poker first you know I had a couple of very supportive girlfriends who I really mistreated you know over the um yeah over the time um and you know I hope if I have newer connections or, or whatever going forward I can maybe be a bit more thoughtful about these and see 
because you know these are the things that life is all about you know or like it's not about poker or hidden diamond elite you know and like if i could go back i would definitely change some of this stuff and try and focus more on my connections with people um but it's very easy to say now that i'm in this position of like where i am it's easy to say oh, i'd like to go back and play it less but you know maybe i'll go back and play less and then you know i resent my girlfriend because i spent too much time with her or like whatever you know like it's very easy to say from this position but um yeah i think it's just it's good to go all in but like you don't need to do what i did and sacrifice your whole life or like give everything and you know you don't have to do that you can still find a some kind of better balance learn from my mistakes you know yeah i think life teaches you lessons as well and I don't think we should spend much of our time looking back at what we could have done differently because one, we can't change it. And two, we don't really know how it would have played out, but we can look back and go, all right, now from my new vantage point, from my new level of experience and perspective, what would I do differently? Or what have I learned from this journey that I can now correlate my actions going forward to do things differently? So as you mentioned for you, your whole journey of high volume, you've learned some lessons about, oh, wait a second, maybe I need to find more balance and like treat my mental health a bit better in my, my kind of, um, almost my inner state a bit better. And then also you mentioned connection and being less selfish and more time for the people, maybe in that as well, but maybe you wouldn't have learned those lessons without going as all in as you went with poker. So it's one of those things where we can't really know um, how things would have played out in, if we went a different way. So for you, it's like, what lessons did you learn and where are you right now? So yeah, I think it's a, a good way to phrase it. So for you right now, what are you most curious about, uh, most excited about going forward? Anything in the poker realm, in life, that's yeah, getting you excited? Um. Yeah, so I always thought about, like, when I quit poker, what am I going to do? You know, everyone, I guess, thinks of this. And if poker goes well, you know, you can finish your career with 30 or something and you have all these years ahead of you. Like, no one knows what to do. And, like, life without a passion or without a job probably can be pretty empty, you know. Um, so I, I guess in the last few years, I've been kind of thinking about this stuff. And, you know, I'm never going to go get a job and, like, work for some guy. It's just never going to happen. Um and I think probably what I'm going to do is just try and enjoy life and like live life how I want to live, you know, and like take a three month trip here, go and like learn how to surf or whatever, go to go to South America. I want to learn Spanish, maybe just go there for six months or a year or like whatever, learn Spanish there, go to Japan, do some stuff there, like see who comes with me along the way and just like live life like that. And I'm I'm pretty excited and looking forward to it. But, you know, maybe this only lasts for a year or two and then I want to do some other stuff or get into a new project or we'll see, you know. But before I found poker, I didn't know what I was going to do. And now poker's finishing. I don't know what I'm going to do, but it's just, you know, go with the wind, see what happens. Yeah, it's like trying to find purpose with your life. And at, each, at certain stages, it's kind of either mapped out for you or it's quite clear. Even during your poker career, it was quite clear what the purpose was and what you were trying to do. Uh, then you almost have success in one avenue or it comes to an end to some degree. And then you go, what's my new purpose? What do I want to do now? And often there's a there's an overlap of what drives you in terms of your, your motives, desires, drives, but also there's some different things as well in terms of things you want to pursue, maybe things you put on hold. So yeah, you're getting to that point where you can almost like, uh, reap the, the, the labor of your success a bit and you can kind of choose some fun things to do other options go with your interests a bit more and uh, yeah who knows where that'll take you i think the game of life is to uh try to figure these things out as we go but also not to put too much pressure on ourselves to know all the answers i think all of us and anyway, everyone listening to this conversation i'm sure has a lot of unknown variables about where they're going in life what they're doing but also the certain things where they're like you know what that really sparks my curiosity or interest right now yeah. i'm gonna go deeper into that and just enjoy that process yeah, I, I would like to give something back or do something good somehow in the world. It's very important for me. I've I've noticed in the last four or five years, like, you know, I've spent a lot of time with poker, but the times where I've been really, like, my happiest is always in a way, like, where you're doing something for someone else, you know? And poker is this very selfish thing where all you're doing, you're not providing anything. You're just taking money from people. Sure, you're providing a bit of an entertainment service to some like rich whales or whatever. But most of the time, you're taking money probably from someone who needs it more than you do, you know. And I've always felt pretty, not pretty bad, but I've always, this has always been in the back of my mind. And now that I'm like older and stuff, and I've noticed like my real happiness has come from like doing things for my, for my friends or helping 
my friends or or stuff like this um this is something that i'll hopefully be able to do more of and so um i'm finishing you know and like being able to share some wisdom or something like uh wacko i don't know if you if you read the high stakes thread on two plus two not too frequently okay because like there was uh some funny hand got posted from a while ago with um one of my friends chris like a new guy where he made a bit of a punt and lost like 300 big blinds in a hand playing heads up or something and it was a lot of money for him at the time and i was with him when it happened and you know after it had happened i could see that he felt like it was it, it, it looked similar to when i lost all this money when i was a kid right and i could maybe see some similar emotions in him and you know when i went through it i had no one to speak to no one to turn to but then when it happened to him i was like right there with him and could share like my experiences and like we we stopped he stopped playing and we like went for a beer and stuff and it felt like even though it was bad what happened to him it felt really good to be able to make him feel better in some way or you know like talk it through him and like almost pass the torch to the younger generation you know and like see these new hungry kids coming through and it like it was like a, a nice moment for me and now when I see these young guys I don't see them as competition you know like I want them I actually want them to be winning jackpots and winning tournaments and really succeeding because I don't see them as competition anymore um and it's just yeah it's nice to have good feelings about people rather than like hating all of your opponents and wanting to see everyone suffer it's just like it's a nice path to have gone down and it just needed time maybe yeah, I think that summarizes a lot of kind of the journey of kind of your own success in poker, where first of all, you're trying to put yourself in a good situation, overcome your own obstacles, put put yourself in a good financial situation and almost like look after yourself in a somewhat selfish way, as, as you mentioned. But then you get a point where you start thinking, oh, wait a second, I'm in a, I'm pretty well, doing pretty good. How can I help with my experiences that I've been through to help other people? And that's like the next chapter where you start thinking, how can I be of help to people around me, my friends, the the world at large, so to speak, in terms of the experience I've been through, which are very useful, very valuable, as we shared today, mm -hmm. and how can I help others on their journey? So yeah, it sounds like you're just starting that. Hopefully this podcast sparks um, some more ideas on how to give back, how to uh, share your wisdom, because this conversation has been very insightful for myself and I'm sure the audience as well. So uh, in terms of parting words or main takeaways for the audience, what would you like them to leave this conversation with today? Um, I guess I would say to any any of the younger guys maybe watching who are like just finding poker now or starting it, you know, like you should really believe that you can do anything, you know, like I'm no smarter than a normal player. You know, I just worked pretty hard and I set goals and like long-term goals and I achieved it. And, you know, so can you, so can anyone just like, don't be afraid to do things, you know, find what works for you and like really, really pursue it. And anyone can be successful. Definitely. I think you're a testament to that, to go on your own path, to go on all in on it, and to kind of the value of hard work um, and the way it can lead you over quite a long sample size in terms of your dedication to your craft, which has been admirable. All right, Rennie, for you, any parting words or questions that you want to finish with? I wanted to actually touch on one more thing because it was actually something that we touched on the previous podcast with Jaser as well. Like when we reflect, and I've, I've heard uh, Frank say a lot about that yeah, I wouldn't really recommend what I do, was it worth it? I think the problem is we're still too young to answer that. Like, I feel like we have to zoom out only when you're, when, when you're dying, you know, you can reflect like was quote, quote, sacrificing some of my happiness for a, a certain period was mm -hmm. the amount of usually in this case, financial gain that I could then leverage by having more freedom, by discovering passion, by helping others in the other 60 years of my life. Was that, a bigger contributor to my overall, like would my overall happiness and life score now be greater because the score of my happiness was a bit lower in that phase of my life. I would say if you zoom out completely, it's always worth it. And I feel like it's almost a necessity to have like a certain amount of time where you're just so obsessed, so dedicated, especially in something as competitive as poker. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's a net positive if we would zoom out further than we are currently able to zoom out just reflecting on our own experience. What do you think about that, Frank? I think that you are probably right. And when I'm 70 or 80 years old or whatever, I'll look back positively and be very glad that I gave 10 years of my life to be able to do what I wanted for the rest of it. But 
I will still look back badly and remember the people that I hurt along the way by doing it and um uh just have some mixed feelings, you know. Sure. Yeah, that that makes sense. But like I said, maybe maybe you've helped more people than along the way that would uh, I guess erase it's not possible, but at least would put it in a different perspective. I cannot really share the same I don't really feel the same, I would say pain obviously i was very self-centered when i was trying when i was on my journey trying to become the best poker player i could be mm -hmm. you know, maybe, maybe, maybe maybe we could get my wife in here to see how she experienced it but uh i feel like i've i've you know i've i've balanced it quite well i was i have to say i was also less focused on i feel like most poker players are very focused on wow now now is the time now is ev now i have to grab on my i never really had that same drive because i always felt like yeah, and then after poker, it's not like I'm going to do nothing anyway. So why do I have yeah, to make sure. all of it now? Now, I have to say, I did now again sort of switch on that perspective because there's a very big difference. Yes, you know, for example, we're here doing a podcast simply because we like to do a podcast, right? It's not like I need this podcast in order to, to pay my rent or something. But like, I think what it sets you up to do is you can do whenever you want because you don't have to. Whereas if you don't set up yourself financially in those years, you might have to do things because you have to. I think that's a very big difference. Now you can just do things purely because you want to, not necessarily because you have to. Yes, you're you're probably going to do something, right? Yeah, for sure. So, But now you're going to do it simply because you want to. You would never have to do anything simply because you have to do it. And I think, you know, that phase in your life has set you up. Like you said, you're, you know, you're going to travel around, discover your passions, uh, not like a, may, maybe that's a good thing to add, like to not fall in the same trap. It's not like we're going to find a passion and then that solves it all, right? It's the journey of discovering the passion. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's that itself, right? It's the fact that you can have these experiences, it's the experience itself that I think, uh, yeah, it's going to contribute a lot to your, uh, to your happiness. Yeah. I like the way you put it. I agree completely. All right. Well, then I would like to thank you a lot for sharing your story it was a very enjoyable conversation yeah thanks for having me on guys i really appreciate it you know you got a cool platform and it was nice to be able to just have a chat about everything i sure. thank, thank thank you for sharing uh for sharing all your wisdom <laughs> i wouldn't call it wisdom but like yeah sure it's uh it was nice thank you frank for sharing your valuable experience over your 14 year poker career a lot of wisdom dropped any main takeaways for you, Adam? Yeah, very interesting conversation. And Frank took a slightly different path to a lot of our other guests. And he went for the high volume mid stakes grinds. And I thought it was very fascinating. As he mentioned, like most of his friends and peer group around him went to play higher. And I'm sure at lots of stages would have been in a pull or incentive to play higher but for him he had a lot of self-awareness and he chose a path that was right for him so success for him was playing high volume and he almost like wanted to control variables but also uh, as we touched on the conversation there's many times where he likes to have linear progression he likes to be able to set volume goals set kind of monthly targets and be able to achieve those and for him he found playing uh, high volume mid stakes was a much better opportunity or path to what he wanted in life and then it goes down to uh, another thing leverage and skills so for him like i'm not sure many players can play the volume he can but he's one of those guys who can play crazy volume that kind of rewards players who play regular games so, so the mid stakes ground again and then also his intuition he mentioned as well and he was leveraging that in terms of how he was learning the game he wasn't putting loads hours in a study in he mentioned conversations with good players and his, his peer group a lot but overall he was learning a lot through his intuitive play and building a massive database of millions of hands on how to play a spot so uh, i think it kind of for me, it was kind of cementing the idea of choosing what success means to you, leveraging the skills that you're good at, and yeah, being able to pick the right the kind of path that that leverages with that. Uh, lost as well about kind of his addictive personality. Uh, I think he was very vulnerable and sharing a lot about the pros and cons of always wanting to play. He had some of those marathon sessions where he play way too long, 50 hours, I think he said, one session after being on a losing streak. But he also mentioned that these kind of strong drives allow him to put in super regular volume where other players can't. So uh, right now he's trying to find that kind of life balance overall, but obviously he's been able to leverage that um, to have a really successful career 
which then kind of sums up the kind of end point which he mentioned towards the end of the conversation about hard work towards an outcome uh, can basically pay off in any av avenue. And Pork has showed him that if you apply yourself and you're committed and you find a way to work hard towards your goals, you can achieve big things. And yeah, I think he's a, a testament to uh, that approach. I'm sure people listening to this who are chasing leaderboards, high volume grinds, will be inspired by what he's been able to achieve through that approach. So uh, yeah, hopefully he's a, bit of a good role model for you guys who are on those high volume pursuits. How about yourself, Brené? What are the main things that interested you today? I think his self-awareness also stood out, right? When you mentioned, yes, he had like this gambling tendencies, but therefore also he made sure that uh, he wouldn't play high stakes because in high stakes, if suddenly he would be suddenly like, what the fuck just happened 10 hours later and he's down 200K, uh, that, that is a problem. So I thought that was like, he kind of knew uh, himself very well and he he used it, like he used the strengths of himself and he limited the downside of his personality to really get the maximum out of his poker career. Um, it's either high volume on mid stakes or lower volume on high stakes. That's something that he pointed out. If you really want your poker career to be successful, in this case, make the most money as possible. And only you know. So that was like, he, he cannot now say, oh, you should do this or you should do that. It's only you. You have to look inside yourself uh, and what really works for you. I remember I had a session with Elliot Rowe a long time ago. And he made me project the high volume mid stakes grind and project the road to high stakes. So he made me visualize both rooms. And for me, it was clearly not the high volume mid stakes mid stakes road. That was making me miserable. Like basically, what what Elliot does, he puts you hip hip no state, and you can visualize the things and experience those emotions. So actually, due to that session, because I was in the same uh, kind of. Uh, doubt or like I, in the path in, in kind of in a split where am I going and that session really helped me determine for myself that I was gonna pursue what I thought was the more difficult road uh, to high stakes but through this visualization I actually realized it was more easy road for me because I would give get a lot of inner energy from from that journey and the other journey to grinding high volume mid stakes would actually cost me a lot of energy so even though I thought the high go, tr trying to become one of the best on high stakes was more difficult. It actually wasn't for me, if I'm still making any sense. <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. um, then if you do decide to go for a high volume, he mentioned, you have to adjust your strategy, right? You have to try to simplify as much as possible range bet. He said he doesn't really de deviate pre-flop, flop, turn. The only street that he focuses a bit more on deviations is the river, right? When pots become a little bit bigger. Obviously, let's say you play one table live poker. You can play as creative and funky as you want, but you have all your brain attention on one table. I mean, go wild, you know? But if you're playing 16 tables, probably not a great idea to get too creative because you will just lose yourself where you were in hands. How the hell did I get in this spot or what happened here before? Which probably he he doesn't he doesn't really have. Uh we thought you already talked about the value. Which in general, right? People know data is valuable. Nowadays, people like to study population data, MDA. Basically, by the amount of volume that he that he has, he has like MDA in his head, but he has actually experienced it. So it's it's not when you study MDA. Sometimes there's a there's a disconnect between your intuition and your brain, which he doesn't possess because all the MDA that he's gathered is through him playing. So his intuition has trained in the same time that his brain is trained. So I think that's definitely a very big uh, upside of playing a lot of value. Understand the perceived ranges I wrote down. He mentioned that perceived you always to have a set if you would flat the small blind and there's a seven, eight or nine on the board. I really love that one. Actually reminded me one where I think it was around that same time we would, or at least the guys that I was in the house with, we would always call, call race because if you played call, call race, you always had a set. So that was just like, like I said, you flat uh, some six for suited or something, you flop a pair, and you call, call, and then you raise the river because everyone has a set. That's the line of a set. That's the perceived line. So if you then add off bluffs to that perceived line and next level maybe play your actual set differently, that's uh, that's ways you can make a lot of money. He talked about mistakes often made, mistakes, people size for what they're trying to achieve. So achievement, bet sizing. Um, it's interesting for the people who want to exploit that. Think about your perceived range when people play with bet sizing, and if it makes more like, if it's more likely that they size up or down to get you to fold your weak perceived range. That's that's my piece of advice that I will throw out there. The rest uh, you have to figure out for yourself. Uh, but yeah, anything you do, there's no way 
around. You have to learn the game at a deeper level, right? He said he played in Ignition, all of these guys learning MDA, but he could just crush them because they were doing things with his deeper understanding of the game that they didn't have. He could easily um, win against their strategies. And the last point that I want to answer on what was the question, was it worth it? And the kind of the conclusion is we're too young to know what likely if you zoom out all the way at the end, it's okay to secret, let's say, to use Jacer's analogy, right? Where you give a score of your happiness. It's okay to score a five out of 10 for a couple of years. If afterwards you manage to score an eight out of 10 for 60 years to go, right? Then if you would live a seven out of 10 every day, probably in the, in the end you were average higher if you made certain sacrifices that then allowed him, for example, he was now going to travel the world, discover different passions, you know, and probably he's going to have a higher experience of happiness in his life than someone who didn't, sacrifice certain things to put himself in the situation where he's able to to do what he's going to do right now. Well, that's, that was a very big summary. But thank you all. If you've listened all the way to the end, I want to thank Frank again for coming on. I want to thank our sponsors, GTO Wizard, Universal Poker. Go check them out. I want to thank Adam for co-hosting this podcast with me. I want to thank the audience for liking, subscribing, all that good stuff. And I will see you guys in the next episode.